Coming up next, we bring you a congressional oversight hearing on timber harvesting in old growth forests. On Thursday, lawmakers heard almost seven hours of testimony from federal officials, scholars, forest economists, and representatives from environmental groups, including the National Audubon Society and the National Wildlife Federation. The witnesses appeared at a joint meeting of the House Interior Subcommittee on National Parks and Public Lands, the Merchant Marine Subcommittee on Fisheries and Wildlife Conservation, and the Agriculture Committee on Forests. Up next, we air the hearing in its entirety. The uh, subcommittee will be in order, or subcommittees will be in order. If you find a, a seat, uh, uh, the, uh, the hearing will be in order. Today, we uh, hope to hear a testimony on ideas for uh, long-term solutions to the controversy over old-growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, there are three subcommittees, and I want to welcome my, my colleagues and, and uh, subcommittee chairman, uh, Harold Volkmer and uh, uh, Gary Studs. And I want to thank uh, uh, them uh, for their cooperation uh, in uh, making this hearing possible and their, for joining together uh, with, uh, with, this, uh, with my own subcommittee to work in this problem. I'm optimistic that by working together we can help uh, ensure uh, implementation of responsible uh, public policy that provides a fair and workable solution to the problem. The issue that must be resolved is how to protect the more of the unique old growth forest ecosystem with its beauty and biological diversity while at the same time providing a stable supply of timber to uh, maintain employment and a healthy timber industry. It's uh, urgent that we act. The Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, if they remain on the schedule, are likely to make a decision on whether the northern spotted owl warrants a listing as a threatened or endangered species. If the spotted owl is listed, the administration will need to quickly implement a plan to protect the, uh, the, uh, the habitat. Furthermore, the, uh, the interim compromise between the spotted owl habitat and timber supply found in Section 318 of the Interior Appropriations Act will expire October 1st of this year, and protection of the owl and, uh, in reality, the old growth uh, ecosystem forest land raises serious questions about the, the impact on the Pacific Northwest economy, on jobs, and on the communities affected. Reasonable public policy is not implemented on a timely basis and impasse for a result which will be obviously damaging to both remaining stands of old growth and the economy. Uh, we have sent along uh, and had requested the uh, participation uh, uh, of the administration, uh, of the uh, two secretaries in this, uh, this instance, and uh, tried to uh, pr try to gain some insights into their, uh, uh, their solutions regarding uh, this issue. Uh, neither Secretary Lujan nor Yeider uh, saw fit to, to be here, uh, nor represented at the secretarial level. We also specifically requested participation by the Chief of the U.S. Forest Service, Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Director of the BLM. It is uh, disconcerting that Chief Robertson and Director Turner are not here uh, today, although there is a representative from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm pleased that Cy Jamison, the Director of the BLM, is here. Because of the national significance of this issue, we've also jointly sent letters to the President asking him to join us in seeking a solution and asking for his proposals for solving this controversy. I would like to enter that letter into the record, uh, and so a copy of that will be submitted to the record without objection. It's made part of the record. We have not, of course, yet received an acknowledgment uh, of the letter or an answer, but it is our uh, hope that the administration will participate and help provide the a leadership necessary to attain a secure future for people, the economy, and the old growth ecosystems of the Northwest. I think we should expect no less uh, in this debate. Uh, the time pressure is uh, short. Uh, the answers have to be forthcoming. Uh, we intend to participate and to, uh, and to play a role uh, as far as the legislative uh, uh, side of this uh, can. Mr. Volkmer. Thank you very much, Chairman Benno. We continue today to consider one of the most critical issues we will face in this Congress the resolution of the interrelated spotted owl, old growth forest and community stability issues as they relate to the Pacific Northwest is both a vital regional issue and a national issue. There is no need to further highlight the importance of this issue. We must now get down to the business of finding a solution which recognizes the value of protecting our nation's resources and securing in our economic base. We need productive comment now more than ever rather than rhetoric. I look forward not only to the testimony we received today, but to the active participation of all those present and others who are interested in development of a process to address the difficult matter before us. 
I just want to say that I'll be having to leave immediately because I have a markup on the Farm Bill and Agriculture Committee uh, ongoing on the research title, and I have several amendments uh, to the research title. But I'll be stopping back in, and I want to join in welcoming uh, Mr. Leonard. I don't know uh, how much time he's getting in the office doing the work these days, but uh, I've seen him this week uh, up here in these halls more than I know probably more time than he's been able to spend in his office. So I want to thank him and uh, welcome him back. And I look forward to hearing the testimony and reviewing the testimony of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Except for me, Chairman Studs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for convening the hearing today. The fact that there are three subcommittees involved is a sign of how complex the issues are and how difficult it is, or I guess I should say impossible, to find an instant legislative solution to a problem that's been allowed to go unattended for so many years. On my own subcommittee, I know there are members deeply interested and involved in this issue whether out of concern for endangered species or for the economic situation in timber-dependent communities of the Pacific Northwest or both. Speaking for myself, I am here to learn I am not an expert on forest management or the timber industry. I am not from the Northwest, and I have never seen or, to my knowledge, been seen by a spotted owl. I have a strong suspicion, however, that the reasons we are where we are on this issue go far beyond one area of the country or one species threatened with extinction. It seems to me that our overall forest management policies need to be reviewed with greater regard for long-term conservation, the taxpayer's dollar, and the preservation of social special ecosystems such as old-growth forests. It seems to me that the National Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service need to work together to identify other areas of our country where timber harvesting might, in the future, destroy habitat for endangered and threatened species so that we can take action gradually to protect those species and avoid the kind of economic problems we now see in the Northwest. It seems to me we should do what we can to ease those economic problems by looking favorably upon proposals to ban the export of unprocessed timber. It seems to me it would be a mistake to look for a quick or easy short-term fix that might treat a symptom or two but would not resolve the real issues at stake. Fiddling with the Endangered Species Act, for example, would be relatively simple. It would also be profoundly wrong. And legislating annual harvest levels is hardly the way to assure sound long-term management of a renewable resource. Finally, it seems to me that the administration can be expected to propose something specific and helpful on some subject sooner or later, and this would be as good a place as any for it to begin. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and to working with you in the future on this and other issues of mutual concern. Thank, Thank the uh, gentlemen, both the uh, subcommittee chairman, for their cooperation. Uh, Congressman Marlin. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I am very pleased to have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I'm very pleased to participate in this hearing and pleased to hear. You mentioned the economic well-being of the Pacific Northwest. I think that's very imperative. We should have a hearing about the economic impact of the actions of Congress, of the, uh, of the uh, Endangered Species Act, of listing the owl. Uh, the economic impact of that perhaps is foremost and should be foremost in our mind. We have an attitude here in, in the United States Congress that, that solutions come from within the beltway. And I think that that is a pretty erroneous approach to take and it leads to, it leads to conclusions that are not ap applicable or valid um, when we get out there in the communities which are actually impacted by decisions we have. So, Hearings are extremely important, and I think that we should have no less than, than hearings on economic impact in Washington. More preferably, they should be in the Pacific Northwest, in Oregon, or in the state of Washington. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for the working people and those who are impacted out there. If we lose 50,000 jobs, they have every, or have the potential of losing 50,000 jobs, they have every right, every right to have some kind of an economic impact hearing in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I was also appalled, Mr. Chairman, to learn of the enormous amounts of private lands located within uh, the habitat conservation areas that will be effectively uh, confiscated by the federal government if the owl is listed. One company alone in Western Oregon has about 15 percent of its own land located within the habitat conservation areas. This clearly, clearly reconfirms my worst fears 
that the Threatened and Endangered Species Act will result in an unconstitutional taking of private property. In my mind, this needs the immediate attention of this Congress, and I commend you for having hearings. Uh, all of the chairman of the committee is concerned and the ranking minority members, and hope we can uh, I hope we can give the people of the Pacific Northwest some reasonable solution, guidance, and direction, um, and, and alleviate some of the pro potential uh, problems that may be coming their way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morrison, uh, Ranking Member Thank on the Agriculture Subcommittee. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I, too, want to join in appreciation for this hearing. I, I consider this hearing a, a stepping stone. I hope it's not designed to limit our options, but in fact to expand our thinking as we look for long-term solutions to the controversy that, that we face. Uh, I am the first of the Washington Oregon delegation to, uh, to speak this morning. I can tell you that we are scrambling to find some sort of answers. Uh, initially, of course, our meetings uh, and our answers are all in reaction to the uh, the spotted owl, which is just a, sort of symbolizes the conflict at this point. Uh, first to the uh, Forest Service's reaction to the National Forest Management Act and potentially to the, uh, to the listing that, uh, that can occur. We've had many meetings and it's only fair to say that uh, our reactions so far are, are as diverse as are the districts that we, we represent. We start with the limitation on log exports, uh, raw log exports. And uh, we have a unified position between the two states on that. And I uh, want to thank everyone here, uh, members of these three subcommittees, for their support uh, for that position and hope we can get it on through uh, the legislative process very quickly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would make, uh, read what, just one line to point out a little bit of the frustration in the Northwest. Uh, this line is from the background. Uh, material prepared for us by the staff. It says, old growth forest is a unique ecosystem that is found primarily in the Pacific Northwest states of Oregon, Washington, and California, period. I would point out that those same ecosystems used to be elsewhere. But in other states, as this nation moved west, they were cut and converted for other economic purposes. And now we face the frustration of being denied uh, the economic opportunities, but at the same time are very enthusiastically pro-environment and want to see some sort of answer found to the conflict that we face in the hearing today. So I thank you for this opportunity and look forward to uh, listening to our witnesses. I thank, I thank the uh, gentleman for his statement and his cooperation. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Unsold, a member of the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Subcommittee under Mr. Studs. Welcome. and. Please, please Thank proceed. you very much to all of you, Chairman, for hosting what could be one of the most important hearings in the lives of many of my constituents. We've got a problem of epic dimensions. If the entire Olympic Peninsula were to slide into the Pacific Ocean, the economic impact wouldn't be any greater than this enormous problem with which we're now grappling. How did we get here, and whose fault Richard, is it? Finding fault is seldom constructive, but in this case, it may be instructive. It's the accumulated actions of all of us. Those of us who admire a beautiful wood paneled wall, environmentalists who want their grandchildren to know the ancient forests, and those of us who come from generations of hard working, hard living loggers. We're all at fault because all of us wanted the days of abundance to go on forever but we didn't plan and we didn't manage for that end. Most important, we didn't sit down together and work across and through the vast chasms of our differences. Now we all face the crisis and we all face losing some of our precious heritage. The wool-shirted lumberjacks who whistle at their work in cold and rain and blizzard and cheerfully stare danger in the eye now face fear and ruin, and they are angry. And there is another danger as we approach this problem with fear and trembling. When emotions are high, they're easily manipulated and exploited. Demagoguery, inflammatory slogans, and cries to pick up a club and slug it out may bring some perception of short-term political gain, but will not help us find solutions. Let us avoid rhetorical attacks on each other. 
Let us roll up our sleeves, let us sit down together to address the long-term sustainability of our forest ecosystems and of our timber communities. What we do in the next few months will either lay the groundwork for a wary but peaceful coexistence between these divergent forces or the demise of the Northwest as we've known it and loved it. The time for band-aid upon band-aid over jutting bones and maggot crawling flesh is over. Now's the time to take up the challenge and find a way to sustain our forest products industry and our precious forest resources. I know we can and here are some of the places to start on new forestry. I believe that if our planet is to survive and support a healthy human population, we must recognize that we need forest products from healthy forests. We cannot view our forests solely for their fiber, but neither can we set them all aside. We need balance. New forestry provides that balance. I believe use of new forestry or new perspectives provides will provide good habitat for spotted owls, but I can't prove it. And I think we've got to. I'm working to develop legislation through which we can experiment with new forestry in a few selected spotted owl habitat conservation areas. We would also practice new forestry outside of the HCAs, providing more important habitat for owls and better forest management for the ecosystem. I'll keep these committees posted on tax incentives. Federal forests in Washington comprise less than 25 percent of the total timber harvest. The bulk of the rest comes from private lands. I'm redrafting a bill that provides a range of real incentives for tree growers. Instead of selling these superb timber growing lands for development, I want to encourage woodlot owners to grow our future for us. My new bill will include a capital gains tax cut, investment tax credit, and indexing for tree farmers who intensively manage their timber lands and an extra credit for domestic processing of the timber they harvest. Reclamation of unproductive forests. There are many thousands of acres of prime timber land growing in the, in the Northwest that are producing nothing but scrub forests. Some of these lands are publicly owned, harvested in the 30s and never replanted and some are owned by small farmers who haven't the economic means to cut the weeds and replant healthy forests. They need to help, and we need to help them, and fast. We need funds to clear the land now, providing some timber for starving mills, and to replant to provide timber for a sustainable forest industry. These are some of the long-term solutions for a healthy forest and forest-based economy but we do have a short-term crisis on our hands also. It was created by Congress and by some of the administrative agencies represented here today. I call upon them and our president to help us find solutions to this crisis. The president has stated that he wants to balance environmental and economic values. The spotted owl issue provides him the perfect opportunity. We now have the benefit of two important documents the Jack Ward Thomas report recommending steps to preserve the biological viability of the spotted owl and the Forest Services and BLM's estimates of the economic costs of the owl protection. A probable listing of the owl under the Endangered Species Act makes it all the more urgent to balance efforts to protect old growth and the owl against the economic and social devastation of timber communities and families. I call upon the President and the Secretaries of Interior and Agriculture to use their existing authority and balance these important values. Last year when Congress created the Band-Aid of Section 318, we required the Forest Service to revise and review its record of decision on the management of the spotted owls in light of new information. I now urge President Bush to require his agencies to incorporate public comments gathered both in writing and in hearings in the Northwest into their revised record of decision. The changes required to protect the owl deserve public comment and attention by the administration to that end. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for providing the forum for this vital issue. I commend you and your staffs on the excellent witnesses you've called, especially Jerry Franklin, 
with his vision for the future, and one of my favorite global thinkers, Bob Spence. I eagerly await all the witnesses' thoughts and long-term proposals for protecting ancient forests and timber communities. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, Robert Smith from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, this uh, hearing is appropriately identified as a hearing on old growth. Uh, the spotted owl is a surrogate issue. If it weren't the spotted owl, it would be one of another hundred species uh, which are claimed to be endangered or threatened. So the spotted owl is uh, really uh, an, an alternative to get at this question, and I think it's proper that you talk about old growth forest, because that's what really is the basis of this whole discussion. I, for just a moment, Mr. Chairman, I want to point out <clears throat> to the committee that, uh, that timber, of course, is Oregon's number one product. It's number one in our economy. It has been for many years. Oregon and Washington produce 50% uh, of the softwoods that are produced in this nation, uh, going towards homes being built across the country, uh, paper products, and other uh, amenities of life. And I must point out also that uh, over the years, through uh, efforts by this Congress and acts of Congress, including wilderness areas, wild and scenic river set-asides, directions to the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management regarding their method of management and the protections that this Congress puts in through directions and, and laws directing the management agencies, we have reduced the public lands that we harvest from from 100 percent to 47 percent today. That's before we begin discussing uh, what many people call ancient forest old growth or the surrogate spotted owl. So we're, we're operating uh, on 47 percent of the forest, and the noose has been tightening for many, many years in our states and in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, suddenly, the Jack Ward Thomas report uh, comes to us, I think, shocked many, uh, because basically uh, our agencies tell us the Jack Ward Thomas report, if implemented, would reduce by 50 percent what we have been historically uh, harvesting in the Pacific Northwest. Listing the owl as an endangered species uh, has the same impact, uh, roughly a 50 percent reduction in the harvest of timber. Either one of those actions, uh, Mr. Chairman, result in a huge economic dislocation in the Pacific Northwest. I've been around the elected representation of people for 29 years, and never in, the, in, in my memory or before that have I ever looked at an issue that has this kind of traumatic economic problems associated with it. In Oregon, for instance, we estimate uh, some 40,000 jobs may be directly and indirectly affected. That's not to, even taking into consideration the infrastructure of counties, which depend, of course, upon the harvest of timber. We anticipate some 1.2 billion uh, board foot reduction uh, in Oregon alone, uh, and that, of course, anticipates the passage of the uh, log export ban of which uh, my colleague from Oregon has introduced, passed out of both committees, as you know, Mr. Chairman, and we anticipate its passage. Uh, the log export ban is a step, but it's really 10 percent of the problem in Oregon. We still have a huge, huge problem uh, with the question of log ex of, of uh, old growth. Well, the question is, how do you plan for such a loss? What do you do with uh, your school systems and your roads and your sewers and your basic services uh, to people after you've ripped out half of the economy in many of those counties? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Many counties in our state uh, are, uh, are more than 75 percent publicly owned. Uh, 52 percent of the state of Oregon is publicly owned. What do you do in a county? when you know the federal government doesn't pay property taxes, 
the only uh, the only association with property taxes is a is a sharing of revenue from timber. What do you do with counties that have 75 percent ownership by the federal government and uh, and of course heavily dependent upon timber? What do you do with those communities? You're not just talking about timber related jobs here now. We're going to wipe out total communities and let's not be wasted away by these averages because uh, there may not be a job lost in Portland, Oregon or Seattle, Washington. But I can tell you in the communities that I represent, uh, it could be as much as 75% reduction in income uh, to those communities and we are going to eliminate them. Eliminate them. So while we're trying to protect the owl, how do we protect another natural resource, which is renewable, by the way, and that's people. Are people worth less than owls? It seems to me that we're pressed to a point that there's no middle ground. We're forced almost to make a decision, and the Endangered Species Act and the possible listing in June uh, force us to almost make a decision between people and owls, because the alternatives, I can tell you, and I've looked at all of them, uh, just don't seem to be viable. They don't seem to be there. Normally, Congress likes to find a compromise and to ease the pain and the burden of, of either, uh, in this case, the owl or people. But I suggest to you, I don't see that as an alternative, and I don't see that happen. My fear is that owls are going to win. Now, you know, people in the Pacific Northwest, as well as throughout America, still look upon Congress as, as the most distinguished deliberative body in the world, and I believe it still is, and yet uh, here we are faced uh, in, in my part of the world and as well affecting this nation with a huge uh, impact economically, and people are asking, well, if the Congress can't satisfy this problem, uh, what confidence can we have in the greatest deliberative body in the world? So I, uh, this is a sad time for me uh, to serve my state and Congress. It's a sad time for this committee, because I know you're torn uh, with protecting something you've never seen and probably never will. Uh, there are nocturnal little fellows, and this owl, and most people that I talk to never have seen them. But we do see clearly people and the tragedy that we're going to cause here by putting people out of work and destroying the Pacific Northwest doing. Thank the gentleman, uh, uh, Mr. Johns. I thank the chairman and want to take uh, a few minutes to make a statement to, with regard to the bill I have introduced, H.R. 4492, to address this uh, <clears throat> old growth issue. All of us remember very well where we were last fall in the controversy over Section 318. And at that time, uh, everyone involved agreed no more one-year fixes. Action must be taken by the authorizing committees to resolve the issue in some other context in the appropriations process, and of course, that's why we're here today. From that concern was born H.R. 4492, the Ancient Forest Protection Act, which I introduced on April 4th and which now enjoys the co-sponsorship of about 49 members of this body. The purpose of this legislation is to set up a process to resolve the old growth controversy. The objective of the bill is to bring about timely action by the Congress to identify for protection those areas on federal lands in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, which are necessary to maintain the ancient forest as a functioning, viable ecological system, and to release the remainder for appropriate management, including timber harvest. Central to this legislation is the idea that areas for possible designation should receive interim protection so that the Congress retains the widest range of options and that Congress would be guided in designating or releasing areas from ancient forest reserve status based on the recommendations of our nation's preeminent scientists with knowledge in this field. I would not suggest to the committees today that this is the only process by which the old growth controversy can be resolved or that necessarily is the best process. I said in introducing this bill and will restate today that I believe that such legislation should be passed 
as part of a package, including restrictions on log exports, assistance to industry in market development, retooling for use of second growth timber, and other appropriate assistance to help communities in economic transition. But I do want to explain briefly to the committees today the thinking that went into H.R. 4492 uh, and how I envision it would operate. This uh, ancient forest protection act is predicated on my belief that our scientific knowledge about how forests function as ecological systems has advanced rapidly over the last 20 years. Appropriately, it was the work begun by one of the individuals who will testify before our committee today, Dr. Jerry Franklin on the Andrews Experimental Forest in Oregon, and work that was continued by many other distinguished scientists uh, in the Forest Service, which has revolutionized our understanding of how ancient forests function. Many in the scientific community believe that the 800,000 acres of ecologically significant ancient forests now protected by national park wilderness or similar status in Washington, Oregon is probably not enough to maintain the forests as viable ecological systems. The original extent of the ancient forests was upwards toward 30 million acres. Today, about 2.3 million acres of ecologically significant ancient forests remains unprotected, which together with the protected forests equals less than 15 percent of the original forest area. I am not here today to say that no more ancient forests can be cut or that I know how much can still be cut and maintain the forest as a functioning ecological system. But I think we should get some good scientific advice on a forest by forest, district by district basis as to what our best scientific understanding of the forest would suggest uh, are the answers to that question and respond accordingly in the Congress. The Ancient Forest Protection Act would begin by allowing the Congress to designate such areas as we might see fit for immediate inclusion in a system of ancient forest reserves uh, to be managed without road building, timber production, or other uh, disturbing activities. I would expect that such areas uh, might be identified on a forest by forest, district by district basis through discussion and negotiation. Perhaps for some forests, several such areas could be immediately identified, perhaps for others, none. I would suggest that the 2.7 million acres of spotted owl habitat conservation areas recently recommended by the Joint Interagency Committee for currently unprotected Forest Service and BLM lands might be a starting point with regard to establishment of reserve areas under 4492. Of course, the Jack Ward Thomas group recommended those areas based on their uh, purpose in maintaining viable populations of the northern spotted owl, not for maintaining viable forests. But there, of course, is some relationship between the two and maps for the HCAs already exist. What the Ancient Forest Protection Act would do, which is equally significant or perhaps more significant than establishing instant reserve areas, would be to provide interim protective status upon passage for a much wider area meeting certain technical definitions in the bill. I emphasize that this is interim protection pending further action by Congress to either designate areas as reserve or release them. When critics refer to this legislation as locking up the forest, uh, this is what is being spoken of. The area that would receive this interim protection, which would also prohibit road building and timber harvest, would include not only ancient forests as defined by the various technical references in the legislation, but would also include what we term associated forest. I will return to this idea shortly, but I want to emphasize that this protective status is not permanent. It isn't locking up anything for good. It is protecting areas only until the Congress takes subsequent action based on scientific recommendations in the open debate of the legislative process to either provide permanent designation reserve or release the areas for general forest use. I don't think that the process of study and designation or release ought to take uh, necessarily a very long time. The legislation would direct the Council on Environmental Quality to convene a panel of experts from uh, universities, government, and the private sector to conduct a study of lands under interim protective status with the objective of identifying what areas should be added into reserve status in order to ensure the sustainability of the old growth ecosystem. This study would be mandated for completion by January 31, 1992. The Congress could then take action to designate lands for reserve or release them as quickly after that date as it might find prudent to act. The idea of associated forests is an important one to the process established by 4492. Associated forests are defined as lands adjacent to proximate to ancient forests, which are necessary to assist in the maintenance 
of the ancient forests' ecological systems or are necessary for the maintenance of various wildlife or plant species associated with the ancient forests. One of the areas of rapidly advancing scientific knowledge is our understanding of the need for reservoirs of genetic material, corridors for passage of wildlife, and buffering functions which these associated forest areas play. To summarize a couple of previous points, I would hope the Congress would pass the Ancient Forest Protection Act or some similar legislation as part of a package to include assistance to the resource-dependent communities which are now undergoing economic transition. This economic transition has been going on for a long time, is going to continue to go on. Uh, I, I think that uh, the jobs that are involved are important and it is only proper for the Congress to provide whatever assistance uh, is possible to these affected communities. The other point that I wish to make is that I stand ready to work with the delegation of the Northwest from industry, with industry, with labor, with the environmental groups, and of course with the members of this subcommittee to discuss, revise, and improve the process which H.R. 4492 would establish or to come up with a different process to resolve this controversy anytime, any place. I think that we need to get to the phase of discussion and consideration of alternatives, and I have put forth this bill as a starting place uh, for that purpose. The ancient forests are as much a part of our national heritage as the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, or the Everglades. We in the Congress need to proceed with legislation which utilizes our newfound understanding of the function of these forests as well as their value to provide for their protection for the benefit of future generations. My hope is that H.R. 4492 will provide a basis for that discussion to begin. I look forward to working with the members of the subcommittee and everyone that's involved to try to reconcile the differences, to try to find the middle ground that uh, my colleagues in the subcommittees have spoken about so that we can meet the nation, nation, nation's need to protect ancient forests and also meet the very important needs of the people who make their home in the northwestern part of our country. I thank the chairman and all the members of the subcommittee for their patience in allowing me to make this statement. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Uh, John Miller. Mr. Chairman, pass. You have no uh, statement. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, did you have a statement this morning? Uh, Thank you. Mr. DeFazio, DeFazio, pardon me. I get Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Italian Vic Fazio. Yeah. Vic doesn't <laughs> pronounce his name properly. Uh, DeFazio. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for uh, holding these hearings. I hope that uh, we do have a result uh, from these hearings and that we do adopt uh, a long-term uh, solution uh, out, uh, through the authorizing committees. Mr. Chairman, mill workers uh, from uh, Lebanon, Philomath, Roseburg, uh, Oregon, and dozen, dozens of other communities in the Northwest are in Washington, D.C. this week. They're here to ask for a resolution to the spotted owl old growth controversy so they and their families can come out from under the cloud of uncertainty that hangs over them and their communities every day. I represent many of these men and women. Each weekend when I return to Oregon, I talk to them, not just in town meetings or union halls, but in the supermarkets, coffee shops, in the street. They're my neighbors, and they're my friends, as well as my constituents. And they don't ask for the easy answers. They know that the balance between timber production and conservation of the public forests is complicated and difficult. But what they ask is for honest answers. They won't get honest answers from this administration, in my opinion. In fact, it appears the administration has nothing to say or explain to these workers. The workers woke up last week to find a nasty present left on their porches, a report that details 25,000 jobs the Forest Service expects to be lost for spotted owl protection, with no one on the doorstep to claim it, explain it, or offer solutions or suggestions to address the problem took over a month just to get that information. Twice I had administration officials schedule meetings with me to discuss the economic impacts of the proposed spotted owl plan. Instead, I was told the administration was still reviewing the reports. Only after Congressman O'Coin pounded the table and threatened the Forest Service's budget several uh, last week in an appropriations hearing, could we get a hurried briefing from agency officials? The big questions remain for me and my workers. Is the Thomas Report the administration policy? If not, what are the alternatives? Why are the timber sales we authorized last year under Section 318 impounded? Why haven't they been offered? Why is the pipeline dry? Why don't we even have a proposal for a timber sale program for next year? I'm tired of Congress being blamed for the spotted owl crisis. 
We rely on the administration to set direction for the management agencies. We have trusted the information they provided to us. Two years ago, we were told the agencies had legally sufficient spotted owl plans. A year ago, the chief came up to the hill and defended the spotted owl DEIS. Instead, when the agencies were sued, they concealed crucial biological information. They concealed the fact a year ago that no one in the Forest Service would testify in favor of the DEIS, no biologist. They provoked a crisis in the Northwest, and they played a very deceptive stall game in the courts. I would call this an abdication of management, except that it's worse. It's blatant political maneuver to use timber workers and communities in the Pacific Northwest as pawns and a calculated strategy to provoke a revolt against this nation's environmental laws. By deliberately making the timber crisis as bad as it can possibly be, the administration clearly wants to light a prairie fire of rebellion against balanced natural resource management. That's why we don't have Secretary Lujan or Secretary Yoder here today. It's not to say or to slight Cy Jameson or George Leonard. They've been thrown into the battle here with uh, very little firepower and uh, I respect them and the work they do. But we need a position of statement on the Thomas Report. We need the administration to offer a credible long-term resolution to the timber crisis that it has exacerbated. The administration has abandoned its responsibility. Congress clearly has to act knowing full well we're being set up to take a fall. We can't trust the administration's numbers. We can't trust their legal advice and we certainly can't trust them to give a damn about the Northwest workers and the Northwest force. I hope that we're going to begin to see a change in that attitude today. Old growth issue. Uh, Mr. Bosco. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I represent the Redwood region of California, which is a region characterized by magnificent huge trees and great forests. Uh, the last of California's natural rivers, and a whole series of very pleasant, old-fashioned style communities. Uh, these communities have a very fragile economy. Uh, they are dependent on two things, fishing and timber. Uh, they haven't gotten the benefit of all the sophisticated world trade and the yuppies and every, Wall Street and everyone else moving up there. Our forests have been cut down once, They've been cut down twice. They've been cut down three times. They built San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. All those beautiful Victorian homes in San Francisco made out of North Coast Redwood. They built California during the 50s and 60s. And yet, this is still one of the most pristine areas in the country. So pristine, in fact, that people from all over the country are coming up to save us. Uh, we, we have set aside over the last 20 years hundreds of thousands of acres of old growth trees. We've set them aside in wilderness. We set aside the Redwood National Park, 100,000 acres of old growth trees. This Congress appropriated, was told it this would cost $50 million. We just finished paying the last bill for the Redwood National Park. $1.4 billion, the most expensive park anywhere in the world. It is also one of the least visited parks in the world. We had rare one and rare two, uh, very similar to what my friend from Indiana is suggesting in his legislation. The cry went out, let's study these areas. Uh, let's study the wilderness. We're not going to set them aside, but we'll study them and then the experts will tell us what can be harvested for timber, what should be set aside in roadless areas. Remember rare one and rare two? All of us from timber areas remember that. What ended up happening? Almost all of it went into wilderness. Hundreds of thousands of acres. 1.2 million acres in California. And each time these wilderness bills, parks bills, rare one, rare two were completed, was everyone satisfied? Had we really reached the decision so that we could move forward with both the environment and industry healthy? No. It all just served as the starting point for the next round of discussions. And with all due respect also to my friend from Indiana, we don't want to be on economic assistance. Our people want to work. They've worked all their lives. Their communities depend on work. And 
we don't want programs like the farm program uh, that I believe permeates well into Indiana, uh, almost over $20 billion uh, for economic assistance. You know, that area was once one of the ancient forests. Uh, the great plains of, of our country were once ancient forests. If we're going to talk about saving ancient forests, uh, we can talk about a good deal of the country. But our people don't want that kind of economic assistance. We want to maintain our way of life. We want to maintain our communities. And we will do what's right by the environment. We want to work on the spotted owl, the marbled merlet, the fisher, the many other varieties and species of uh, birds and mammals that we still have, miraculously enough, after all these years. I mean, they're still there. Somehow they've survived without the help of all these national groups. But we're ready to do what's right. I admire the fact that the chairman and uh, Mr. Studs and uh, Mr. Volkmer have written to the president asking for him to come forward with a solution to this problem. But I would say we have to come forward with a solution to this problem. People elect us to solve problems. They don't elect the timber companies. They don't elect the Sierra Club. They don't elect the judges. They elect us. And it's our responsibility to solve this problem in a way that we can get back to business and still protect the various species. <clears throat> I thank the gentleman. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Uh, McDermott, my colleague from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing. It's the second hearing this spring on the long-term protection of America's last remaining ancient forests and the transition from old growth logging for the Northwest communities that have come to depend on federal timber. We can achieve these goals only by working together, Northwesterners and other Americans, and we must all be involved. That's why the three subcommittee chairmen wrote to the president last week. Two years ago, last month, George Bush, during the campaign, came to Puget Sound, stood on the shores, and said, I'm going to be the environmental president. The president's been totally silent on this environmental issue. At the very least, Americans have a right to expect the president to assure the laws are faithfully executed, that the endangered species listing decision is free of political interference, that the Forest Service performs its duty to protect ancient forest ecosystems, and that timber harvests reflect genuine, sustained yield principles, not just revenue needs. At best, we could hope for the kind of leadership our chairman has asked the president to provide. The most important question in their letter was whether the president supports an ecosystem approach or one that focuses only on a single species. The need to protect ancient forests has often been confused with the need to prevent the extinction of the spotted owl. This is not just about spotted owls. The Northwest's ancient forests are an irreplaceable national treasure. Nowhere else in the world does this unique and rich combination of plant and animal life exist. Since the ancient forests belong to all American people, their future is in the hands of all Americans, not just Northwesterners. But Northwesterners, too, want to see these forests preserved. Last month, the Seattle Times took a scientific poll of a statewide, and I emphasize a statewide sample of Washington State residents. The question was, Federal scientists are proposing to ban logging on about two and a half million acres of old growth forest in the Northwest. They say this is necessary to protect the habitat of the spotted owl. Can you give me the testimony? Opponents say the ban will cost thousands of jobs in timber dependent communities in Western Washington. Do you favor or oppose such a ban? The responses were 52% in favor of a ban, 38% opposed, and the rest undecided. I remember that's a statewide poll, not just Seattle and my district. And I think the answer was asked in a balanced way. The question was asked in a balanced way. One person who responded, a lumberyard supervisor in Kitsap County, said it very well. You have to draw a line someplace. This has nothing to do with the spotted owl. They, meaning the timber industry, are looking for an excuse. Washington State, he said, is a nice place to live, and we're losing it real fast. We who live in the Northwest live there because we love it, knowing that we are losing what is left of our forest environment. We also know that families and livelihoods are at stake 
after a century of private and public overcutting. I hope we can work together with other Americans to protect our forests and our forest family. And I look forward to the hearing today. You have many good people from Seattle, from the university, here to testify as experts. Thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> uh, clearly, the challenge is to, to try and take in the ideas. Uh, now we are on a time schedule where we have to make decisions. And I want to assure my colleague from California and others that we intend to do so. If people have ideas, uh, we'll listen. Uh, we don't have any uh, uh, hesitancy to act. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, we would like to uh, have the benefit of others to express their ideas and for them to run the gamut of uh, public uh, scrutiny uh, rather than just to sit back and take uh, pot shots. So, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Morrison. I have a statement uh, by a member of our subcommittee, uh, Wally Herger from California. I'd like yes. to ask. Well, he was here and he's, he's, he's back now. So does he want to be recognized, uh, Mr. Herger? Give your statement. Mr. Herter. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this uh, very important hearing on an issue that is crucially important to many thousands of us in Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. The issues surrounding the management of old growth forests, including the conservation of the Northern Spotted Owl, are crucially important to the people who live in my district. This hearing today is as much about the future of the timber communities in Northern California as it is about the survival of the spotted owl and the preservation of old growth forests. The currently proposed federal actions to conserve spotted owl habitat will not only result in the loss of thousands of jobs over the next few years, but also will greatly diminish the amount of revenue returned to the state and local governments from the federal timber receipts. The timber-based economy of Northern California is already on the brink of economic catastrophe. And the direction that the agencies are moving in now will surely put us over the edge. Since the proposal to list the spotted owl under the Endangered Species Act was made last spring, there has been a great deal of evidence brought forward that contradicts the limited amount of data that led the Fish and Wildlife Service to believe that old growth is essential for the preservation of the species. Much of the evidence that is emerging from studies being done in Northern California indicates that owls are surviving and reproducing in managed non-old growth forests. This new evidence rejects the Fish and Wildlife Service premise that spotted owls only live successfully in old growth forests in California. Because of this conflicting data, I believe that it would be hasty and irresponsible for the federal government to take such drastic action as is currently proposed. I believe that the people of our timber dependent communities deserve greater consideration than they have been receiving recently. And I urge my colleagues to carefully consider the consequences of federal old growth policy. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to call the uh, first panel of witnesses. And uh, we would ask unanimous consent that all members' statements be made part of the record in their entirety. Those, there are many that will be coming in today. And without objection, that will be ordered. And I'd ask unanimous consent that the statements of all witnesses and accompanying documents as they're relevant to the testimony be made part of the uh, hearing record. Uh, hearing no objection, that will be ordered. So I would ask uh, Mr. Leonard, Mr. Overbay, uh, Mr. Jameson, and Mr. John Fay uh, to uh, come to the table and uh, thank them. I would uh, just at the beginning again reiterate in my statement we had sent uh, uh, questions to the President and to the respective secretaries and uh, both uh, Secretary of Agriculture and Secretary of uh, Interior. And I personally asked the Secretary of Interior to answer or respond to those uh, questions themselves. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome. We will not uh, limit your uh, time as administrative witnesses, but if you want to summarize your statements, I'm certain there will be uh, uh, numerous opportunities to expand on your uh, statements through the question process as we expect uh, to uh, go into uh, uh, some detail with regards to 
uh, the questions raised. Mr. Leonard, it's been noted that you, you've appeared frequently and we are especially appreciative uh, uh, of your presence. I'm going to ask, uh, as a matter of protocol here, ask Mr. Jamison, who's a director, uh, to, uh, to uh, proceed. Mr. Uh, Jamison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'm pleased to take this opportunity to discuss old growth forest issues on BLM lands. Two laws provide the guiding principles and policies for our management activities. They are the Oregon and California Railroad Land Grants Act and the Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976, better known as FLIPMA. FLIPMA is important for its emphasis on land use planning process as the basis for land management decisions and its reiteration of the principles of mul multiple use and sustained yield. BLM manages old growth timber in accordance with timber management plans. These plans include the harvesting of old growth timber as well as established in several areas for the protection of other resource values and for scientific research. We are continuing to re-examine our management practices in light of recent litigation dealing with protection of the northern spotted owl habitat and in preparation for developing resource management plans for the 90s. Of the 2 million acres we manage in western Oregon, 1.6 million acres are classified as commercial forest lands. It is especially important to note that BLM timberland in western Oregon is not well blocked but in a checkerboard pattern. Most BLM tracts are not undisturbed but are fragmented as a result of several decades of timber harvest and forest regeneration. Thus, they represent a rich mosaic of new clear cuts, young plantation, pole and mature size stands, as well as old growth. We estimate that about 448,000 acres of old growth timber remain on BLM administered lands in western Oregon. Of this total, about 143,000 acres are protected from timber harvest through existing management plans. With respect to our annual allowable sale quantity, old growth timber accounts for about 376 million board feet or 32 percent of our current sustained yield level of 1.176 billion board feet. We are developing resource management plans for Western Oregon with a great deal of public involvement in the process. Our plans will be completed in fiscal year 92 and implemented in fiscal year 93 addressing the full range of issues, including the question of protection for the ecological significant old growth forest. Also, we determine a new allowable sale quantity. Regarding Section 318 of the 1990 Appropriation Act, BLM is directed to, one, offer volumes of timber from Western Oregon in FY90 to meet an aggregate level of 1.1 or 1.9 billion board feet for FY89 and 90. Two, designate and protect a total of 122 owl habitat sites as agreed to with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And three, appoint BLM district advisory boards to review and provide recommendations on timber sales. And lastly, consider the recommendations of the Interagency Scientific Committee in development of new land and resource plans. We intend to meet the timber sale volume commitment for fiscal 90. 100, 512 million board feet has been offered to date. 634 million board feet will be offered by September 30. Eighty percent of the offered volume has been protested. While we continue to act under Section 318, it is important to note that there is a coordinated effort to provide for cooperation on management and research of the spotted owl. The Interagency Scientific Committee, chaired by Jack Ward Thomas, was formed to develop a scientifically credible conservation strategy. The Scientific Committee report proposes a two-part conservation strategy. One, establish large habitat conservation areas, or HCAs, to ensure the owl's long-term survival. And two, research and monitor to test the adequacy of the strategy. Outside of the HCAs, protection would have to be given to categories three and four. And we would follow the 50-11-40 rule. This rule requires that we maintain 50% of the forest with trees averaging 11 inches in diameter or larger and with a 40% crown closure. BLM management managers and staff will analyze these recommendations to determine what additional management options may be available. A holistic approach to old growth forest management will better consider all resource values in addition to providing protection for the northern spotted owl. These are aspects and recommendations of the report which, if adopted, would have far-reaching and severe economic impacts on northwest logging and milling operations, as well as the reduction of revenues to counties from timber sale activities. Our economic analysis of the impact of the Scientific Committee report starts from our existing planning sale level of 1.176 billion board feet. In summary, it shows that the annual sale of timber from BLM lands in Western Oregon would be reduced 62 percent. 
We estimate that 7,670 jobs would be lost and that the Western Oregon counties could lose 85.2 million or 53 percent of their current revenues from BLM timber sales. These are significant impacts. And I think it's important that we analyze all of our management options and consider long-term solution. This administration is mindful of the commitment to uphold the spirit and the letter of the laws contained in the Endangered Species Act of 1973, as well as other relevant laws. The operation of government has never been and should never be a one-sided or unilateral. The socioeconomic impacts of such a regionally critical issue must be addressed. The administration is very aware of the serious economic impact that Spotted Isle is listed as threatened or endangered. We must keep in mind the full range of impacts that result from single species protection. When we protect just one species or one habitat, we are more likely than likely creating additional problems for other species. We in BLM are very concerned that we're slowly moving to protecting more and more areas for just one species. I am told, excuse me, Oregon has 17 species currently federally listed as threatened or endangered, and 192 plants and animals that are candidates for listing. The question has to be asked, are we going to have 200 plus special management areas set aside? What kind of management does that engender? The time has come to work with all interested parties to try to develop a better system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you very much, uh, Director Jamison. And uh, we'd like now to ask, I guess Mr. Leonard has the prepared statement for the Forest Service. Mr. Leonard, welcome, yeah. Associate uh, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do appreciate the efforts of these uh, three committees, three subcommittees, uh, to get a good understanding of the problems of the management of the forest resources, particularly the old growth forest resources of the Pacific Northwest. During the last few weeks, there has been a great deal of activity in response to the Interagency Scientific Committee's uh, conservation strategy for the northern spotted owl. Currently, the Forest Service is reviewing its December 1988 decision on spotted owl management for the Pacific Northwest in light of the Interagency Scientific Committee report, as required by Section 318 of this year's Appropriations Act. We do plan to have a new decision in place by the end of the year. That's by the end of September. To maintain the option to implement the Interagency Scientific Committee recommendations, both the Pacific Northwest and the California region are following the report's guidelines for planning timber sales, uh, timber sales per scheduled for the current fiscal year that have not been awarded but are located within the spotted owl habitat conservation areas. According to the ICS guide, ISC guidelines, where alternative sales are not available, timber sales planned for fiscal year 1990 that are within the habitat conservation areas may proceed except where pairs of owls are within a half mile of the individual sale units. In that case, the report recommends that these sales be modified to avoid significant impacts on the functioning of the HCA. As soon as we receive the report, we delayed a award of any new sales in the habitat conservation areas pending a review to determine how much volume was to be affected by this. In Region 6, about 150 million board feet of the currently planned sales are within a half mile of pairs within the uh, habitat conservation areas. In Region 5, about 70 million board feet are within this half mile. Both regions are proceeding with sales that are not within this half mile uh, of the pairs of owls, and these sales total about 1.25 billion board feet in Region 6 and 400. 40 million board feet in Region 5. Based on our review of the Interagency Spotted, uh, Scientific Committee report, we believe that timber harvest levels would be reduced about 48 percent from current levels on federal lands, that's the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management, containing spotted owl habitat in Oregon, Washington, and California. Now, some of this reduction does reflect uh, land management decisions being made in our, as we finalize forest management plans, as well as the impact of the spotted owl uh, protection suggested. Our current plans call for timber harvest level of 3.9 billion board feet for the national forest in the Pacific Northwest and Northern California that contains spotted owls. Under projected final plans, the timber harvest levels for these forests is expected to be about 3.2 
billion board feet. If the recommendations of the interagency scientific committee are reported, we estimate that the resulting harvest level would be about 2.2 billion board feet for these forests. In other words, a reduction of about a billion board feet directly associated with implementing the uh, scientific committee report. Currently, the timber harvest levels on the federal lands, again, Forest Service and BLM in this area, support about 53,000 jobs. With implementation of the conservation strategy, some 25,000 uh, of those jobs would be lost by 1995. Our analysis, our timber models indicate that uh, there is a potential for a short-term offsetting of that, that reduction through a, an increase in harvesting uh, on private lands, which you can expect as a result of a, uh, a price increase resulting from the shortage of timber. I would acknowledge that some people in the timber industry who I have a great deal of respect for, who are in the business of buying timber from those private lands, uh, do not believe that that increase will occur, that in fact the price is up and, there, and uh, any increase is already reflected. If they're right, instead of our models, then the, the employment impact will be felt earlier than we are predicting. Our, our models suggest that rising prices will partially offset the revenues to the Treasury and the payments to counties. Uh, however, full implementation uh, would mean a decline in revenues to the Treasury of some $148 million. And the opportunities for offsets uh, vary substantially between, uh, between units and uh, as we, particularly as you look at the uh, Bureau of Land Management lands, uh, the ONC lands in, in the state of Oregon, where the 50 percent of the revenues are shared with the counties, the impacts on local counties will be uh, significant. Mr. Chairman, throughout the Forest Service history, we've tried to develop the scientific and social support for a judicial balance between protecting the environment and producing products. The debate, conflict, and controversy surrounding old growth <coughs> forests, spotted owls, and timber supplies in the Pacific Northwest forces our society to once again examine its preference for approach to the managing the national forest. Our emphasis in balancing the dual task of protecting the environment and producing goods and service has shifted over the years. This shift reflects changing public values as well as a significant increase in our understanding of the functioning of forests and forest ecosystems. We are moving in the direction of managing for healthy, diverse, and productive ecosystems rather than managing for specific products or specific resources. The evidence of this is clear in the upcoming RPA program, in forest plans, and in our priorities on research and cooperative assistance. As we seek solutions to the spotted owl, old growth, timber supply issues, we are mindful that the larger perspective of the public lands that in the larger perspective, these public lands are comprised of ecological systems that have and will continue to provide multiple benefits to people. We are taking several actions to protect old growth forest values in the Pacific Northwest. Last fall, we announced our position statement on national forest old growth values. And a copy of that statement is attached to my testimony. Basically, our position is that we recognize the many significance of values associated with old growth, and we will manage the national forest to protect these values. And among those values, of course, is the production of high-value forest products. Specific decisions on existing old growth stands will be made through the forest planning process and in full compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act. The planning regulation for implementing Section 6 of the National Forest Management Act require maintenance of viable populations of all native vertebrate species well distributed to the range. This provides the Forest Service with a specific mandate for dealing with the spotted owl decision. The long-term solution for protecting the ecological values inherent in old and mature forests while maintaining access to them for high quality products and services is to manage significant areas to perpetuate the values found in mature ecosystems while at the same time managing them for the production of goods and services. 
the amount and location of protected areas and the amount and location of, uh, of areas managed for production are the policy questions which we are faced with currently. Scientific and technical analysis can only inform us of the consequences of our options. They do not offer unique or guaranteed solutions. Once some basic land allocations are made, scientists and managers can deal with how best to meet the specific goals for particular areas. To address the goal of perpetuating ecological values in managed forests and rangelands, we have initiated a program we call New Perspectives in Managing the National Forest System. It's a program that took its, took its start in the Pacific Northwest, but we're applying in all regions. This program will develop, test, and demonstrate practical ways to blend protection of ecological values with the production of natural resources. It will concentrate on the management of whole ecosystems rather than single species or just one resource at a time. It will bring scientists, educators, public and industry, and professional resource managers into a more effective partnership in carrying out our conservation reserve programs. Dr. Jerry Franklin, who is on your next panel, uh, has done much of the, the scientific and groundwork in providing a, a basis for this concept. The basic management principle behind new perspectives is that a healthy, diverse, and productive environment is the key to sustainable use of natural resources, and both are key to the survival of the human species. Several aspects of new perspectives are already being tested for the, their utility in perpetuating old growth values in the Pacific Northwest. Let me cite several. Minimizing the fragmentation of contiguous forests during harvesting. Retaining biological legacies of standing live and dead trees and fallen logs. Restoring naturally diverse forests following harvest. Maintaining a forest, forested landscape that allows for free movement of plants, animals throughout the ecosystem, and the active participation of people affected by local decisions in designing and carrying out these management practices. The practices I cite provide for a healthy, diverse, and productive forest that maintains some of the structure and function that comes with old growth in the landscape. They neither maximize old growth preservation nor the harvest of wood fiber. They represent an attempt to find a reasonable balance of goals, values, and uses. Simple old growth preservation and timber harvest are inherently incompatible, at least in the time frames that we humans talk about. Legislation that allocates land areas to one primary value or another could, reserve, could resolve the conflict, but it may not be a good long-term solution. This is essentially how the wilderness area designation resolves conflict. But if we are to bring this uh, controversy to at least a, t a temporary close, we may need legislation that finds sufficient any solution on how old growth is to be preserved, how much is to be managed under new perspective type concepts, and how much is to be managed for higher harvest levels. I think it is important to remember that when we decide to favor certain resource benefits, over others, we should do so in full and conscious understanding of what we are getting and what we are giving up. Our forests have great capacities to assure a quality living environment and to meet society's needs for wood products, but they do not have unlimited capacities. We cannot expect forests to provide more of everything for everybody, and we cannot continue to approach ecosystem management as a process of continually slicing the pie into ever smaller special use pieces. Ecosystems change just as scientific knowledge and people's goals and expectations change. We must approach stewardship of public forests with an eye to their long-term resilience, sustainability, diversity, and productivity. Preservation of some stands is an important part of how to accomplish that desired condition. Judicial management is also an important part. Mr. Chairman, I would be pleased to respond to questions from the committee. Well, thank you, Mr. Leonard, uh, for your effort in putting the statement together. And same to Director uh, Jamison. I know that 
These are uh, difficult questions, and sometimes you've answered them, and sometimes you haven't. <laughs> Mr. Jamison, one of the first questions we asked was, uh, 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 in your attached document, was uh, what long-term solutions uh, do you propose, uh, of course, uh, and how much old growth forest can be preserved? Uh, my dilemma is that your answer says these, uh, you talk about the, the resource management plans of the BLM, and uh, then you talk about fiscal year 92 and 93. Uh, we're operating on a little different uh, time frame here, uh, like in about uh, two weeks or two months, I have to come up with something. Uh, can you give us any uh, guidance? Uh, with regard to this, I, I will you be providing any guidance before then? We're working on see if there's some other options out there right right now. Well, let uh, me let I, me finish off, Pardon Mr. Me. Chairman. Uh, we are just happen to be starting our cycle, and the Forest Service just happens to be ending their cycle on land use plans. That's one of the, our unfortunate things that we're dealing with too. Right. So, we're going to try to uh, factor in and see if we can come up with some different alternatives too. Because to that. I don't have any in hand right now. I think you're going to have to, uh, I mean, I realize that we're asking you to ad lib to, to set aside, I guess, the forest management plans or uh, the resource management plans uh, in both instances and say, hey, we got a problem. We have to do something about this. And uh, do you believe that a legislative solution is necessary, Mr. Jamison? I know you didn't answer that question either. Well, uh, I think I'm going to agree with my uh, fellows from the Forest Service is that uh, if we come up with a solution, we may have to have a legislative buy-off on it to give us some protection to actually Im implement it. We have two acts out there that are just going head to head. And if we can cut all the fluff out and really get down to the basics of it, and the basics of it is that we have, the, uh, in my case, the, the ONC Act and FLIPMA, and then we, we do the planning under that and it gets up to a certain point and then the Endangered Species Act can, in certain instances, kick in on top of that. And so when, if we come to a solution working together with Congress, uh, we may have to have you some, in, uh, some insurance on that, that that is, meets, the, meets the goals of the acts. Well, I mean, right now, I mean, what is your position going to be before the, uh, the Appropriation Committee? I'm going to go there and testify this afternoon and tell them not to put any uh, 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 floors in in terms of uh, uh, annual uh, sales quota. I don't want them doing that in the bills anymore. What's your position going to be on that? Uh, it depends on what kind of a solution we come up with, I guess. <laughs> it's a good way to well, what, what are you going to ask the Appropriations Committee to put a, a number in the bill, or are you going to oppose that? No. I would prefer that uh, we can handle what's in our uh, plan right at the moment on 318. That is a, probably no, a, a... I mean, that's a, law. I mean, that's, I guess you can handle But that's it. also, we think we can come close to that number uh, in the future. Because that's probably where we would come back down to an ASQ. Yeah. Okay. I don't know that you, you maybe can handle it in terms of sales, but I don't know if it's consistent with NEPA and the, uh, and, uh, the uh, listing uh, and the other ecological uh, that's, factors, is that's it? That's the point. That's the point I'm coming Well, I'd say with, it's sir. a major point. Uh, yeah. Have you also uh, uh, done anything in terms of the, uh, the uh, Thomas report, in terms of responding with, uh, with your sales programs? Yes, we're trying to keep that option available. We're, we're trying to avoid the HCAs as to the extent possible. I mean, right, pardon me, but right now in 1990, yes, are you sir. doing it? Yes, you sir. are. Yes, sir. I mean, Mr. I, I think Mr. Leonard indicated that uh, you are responding to that report by attempting to suspend sales in those areas. Is that correct, Mr. That's Leonard? Correct. Yeah, I want to add one thing. Well, Mr. Chairman, on, yes. on that, we're trying in the HCAs, the actually the habitat conservation areas, and where the owl is has a 1.5 mile protection and a uh, quarter mile protection. We're trying our darndest to stay out of that. Under the 50 11 40 rule, uh, we probably cannot stay out of that part. Well, I understand that you may have some problems uh, with just, regards just to that, but I'm just land. asking what your attempt and intention is, whether or not you get forced in a different direction, why we can get to that, cross that bridge when we get there. But I want to commend the Forest Service for attempting to do that as well, Mr. Leonard. Uh, you want to comment on that? Well, yes, we, we are. We are trying to make maintain the options. The the Interagency Scientific Committee recognized the, uh, the direction we had for 318, and they, they provided some guidance on how we would uh, conduct ourselves uh, in fiscal year 90. Uh, now, for, for the out years, uh, fiscal year 91, we are planning no sales in those areas uh, that would be inconsistent with the uh, direction. In other words, there will be no sales in fiscal year 91 uh, planned in the habitat conservation areas. 
What about uh, your appearance before the Appropriation Committee? Are you going to oppose a uh, annual sales uh, quota? Fortunately, we've already been there, uh, and 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 at, at that time we uh, we su uh, supported the uh, existing president's budget. However, we have, uh, in response to questions from the Appropriations Committee, indicated that for fiscal year 91, if we protect all the options in the habitat conservation areas and and the uh, the the uh, decisions. Uh, standards and guidelines that are in uh, for either the final forest plans or where we anticipate coming out with the final forest plans, that our maximum capability to offer sales in uh, the Pacific Northwest will be about a total of three billion board uh, feet. Yeah. Um, well, I know what the possibilities are, but I'm asking what the administration position is with regards to having uh, uh, hard targets in the appropriation bill this year in terms of cutting for 1991. I mean, that's what we have to deal with. If you have numbers, what numbers are is the budget supporting? Uh, Mr. Leonard, Mr. Jameson, what is the administration's position? Doesn't the administration have a position on that? Do they want hard targets in the appropriation bill or not? I think the administration would always prefer not to have hard hard targets. So your position is not to have any target in the appropriation bill, Mr. That's, Jameson? That's, that's correct. Uh, Mr. Vento, in all honesty, it's we're being driven on the June 23rd date. That's going to set a lot of our parameters well, I for our target. How are we doing? Too. Are we on schedule? For June 23rd, I'd have to With refer to Dr. Mr. Fay. Dr. <laughs> Fay, you want to comment about the schedule uh, yes, for sir. the uh, listing of uh, the endangered species, at least one of the endangered species? Well, I, as you say, the, the decision has not yet been made. Uh, we are fully expecting to have it made and announced by June 23rd, which is the Mr. The Jameson said that uh, the whole plan would be up to you then, that you'd be running the entire BLM and the forest <laughs> plan. Did you notice that answer? <laughs> I, I'm that not he sure has no I role whatsoever at that particular point, that it's all Mr. Turner and uh, Mr. Fay's decision. Don't you expect BLM to do anything? What will you be telling BLM to do at that point, Mr. Fay? Uh, if, for instance, they were to list that. If, if the owl were to be listed Jan uh, June 23rd, the requirement would be that the BLM then consult with us on means of protecting the owl. The, uh, the exact uh, context of that consultation is going to be something that will have to be decided between the two agencies. And principally, it will be the, the BLM that has that call. Wouldn't it be a lot better, Cy, if we so? dealt with a, this on an ecosystem basis rather than just on a single species basis? I mean, here we can solve the owl problem, then we're going to have the ferret, then we're going to have the banana oh. slug, and you know. Uh, it, Mr. Chairman, it, it makes sense. It's, it's the only way we can make management sense. We, whether it's the desert tortoise in, in Nevada and California, large, large areas are involved. We have to come to some kind of a reasonable solution. Now, if we propose a reasonable plan that is approved or bought off on or blessed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, I think we need some protection on operating under that plan. So there, therefore we need a protection system for uh, old growth forests as an example uh, would uh, accomplish that? I don't think that, uh, you know, what, what are you going to start into? Rare one, rare two uh, for no, old growth? I'm, I'm uh, not talking about anything else. We've got enough confusion without confusing it with wilderness. I'm just <laughs> asking if we need an old growth protection system, it's all I'm asking. If we provide the plan, which I assume our plan when we come up with it, is going to protect additional acreages of old growth forest, I think it will. The public is, is sending us that message. Also, the spotted owl sends us that message. I think the scientists Why would you have to legislate message, it? Yeah. Why would you have I think to legislate the terms, it? Yeah. Mr. Leonard, do you agree generally with Mr. Jameson's response in terms of an eco eco ecological wide uh, or broader uh, protection basis? We certainly do uh, agree that the, the rational way to manage uh, for these forests is on an ecosystem basis and not on a species by uh, species basis. Having said that, I uh, would have to acknowledge that we don't know all, all about those ecosystems, so it's, it's, it's in order to do that. But we, we think even with the basic knowledge that we do, we can do better directing our, knowledge, our efforts towards dealing with ecosystems rather than simply on a species-by-species uh, species basis. I'd also note that the uh, Interagency Scientific Committee in their development of the strategy for uh, uh, conservation of the spotted owl made the, makes the same point very yeah. uh, well. My time must have expired. They should have been keeping the timer on me as well as all the members. So I, uh, you weren't doing it, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Volkmer. <laughs>
Yes, George, uh, and just along that line, as, as I understand in your response uh, in the supplement, uh, you pointed out that if the spotted owl is listed as endangered, you will be uh, managing uh, on a specific uh, issue uh, type of thing, correct? Both of you will. Well, I would That'll hope. That'll be part of it. You, you, I mean, you, you're you going, would, you're first going to have very, to do that. that you're going to have to specific. work with the Fish and Wildlife and to do that. That's correct. We'd have that very specific uh, uh, direction and it would be targeted towards recovery of that very specific species. I would hope that, would be that we can on top of that then, together then the rest, with an ecosystem The rest of approach. the forest you could do on ecosystem basis. Yes. Right. So that's really not what you want to do, but you're not, you don't have your options uh, necessarily. That's correct. That's, that's correct. Right. Uh, and looking at uh, statements, Jameson, there's something uh, I have not, since I'm not a member of this Committee of Interior, I've been that familiar with the BLM process. Uh, you point out on page four of your statement the Oregon California Railroad Land Link Grant Lands Act requires the BLM manage all suitable timberlands for the sustained production of forest products to provide for community and industry stability. Timber production is given priority on lands determined to be suitable. We also consider other appropriate multiple use benefits. Now that's a little different than what we have as far as the Forest Service, is it not? That's absolutely correct, sir. So timber production on BLM lands, when the BLM lands were set aside from the Railroad Act, that was said, well, that's for timber and, of course, reproduction of that timber. And then we had one other act, sir, that come in on top of that, and that was called FLIPMA, the 76th, the, the Federal yep. Land Policy Act. So that's interwoven there also. But that Oregon and California Railroad Grants Lands Act was never repealed. That's correct, sir. So that's a little bit of an inconsistency in what we have, right? That's correct. So Congress has given you that inconsistency. Uh, I won't blame you, but uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, not us, not this, but I mean, in that time frame. Yeah, it was 19, I think. Right. 13. But when, when they did the Management Act, they didn't repeal or change the priority as far as the uh, BLM lands. They, they, give us, they give us the, uh, the goal of, of providing sustained yield timber from these lands. That was the mission for the lands. It's been modified slowly over time, and then it was modified more by, by FLIPMA, but that's still a, a, a basis of law out there to operate under. But you are in the process of uh, preparing and plans, and be on page five you say completed in fiscal 92 and implemented in fiscal 93 address the full range, correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Now, uh, as I understand it, uh, you're going to have a approximately 62% estimated reduction in uh, timber harvest as a result of the uh, spotted owl, even if it's not endangered. Uh, that's, that's not uh, quite accurate. I guess this, if it's listed, yes, we're going to be, a, we estimate that our impact will be 62 percent if we implement uh, Jack Ward Thomas. Uh, well, let's assume, that's what I mean. Let's say assume that we, you do implement the, the Thomas report. Yes. As far as the amount of habitat that would be necessary. That's correct. That be, leads to a 62 percent reduction. That's correct. And even if the Fish and Wildlife doesn't necessarily list it, you'd probably still be required to follow something like that. Uh, when we go out from underneath the protection of uh, uh, Section 318, I think that we're going to have uh, impacts that uh, probably equal to what uh, Jack Ward Thomas uh, uh, report right. if we implemented it would Now, result. at the present time, of course, a good part of your funds go to the counties uh, in Oregon. Fifty percent. Uh, will uh, payments in lieu of taxes replace that? Uh, no, payments in lieu of taxes is uh, 105 million for the whole United States, and it's divided up, uh, divided up among the Western land states that way. So That's a limited not, fund. So we're not just talking about an economic impact on the mills and the people who work in the mills and the people who cut the logs, and that type of thing. We're looking at a adverse impact on schools and towns and county governments. Uh, in Western Oregon, are we not? 
Yes, sir. And one of the things that really bothers me personally is we're, we're basically impacting one strata out there. Correct. Communities of 3,000 or less will be, uh, I, I was told that they did a study out in Oregon that they had about 72 communities that are 3,000 people average. And about 60 of those were uh, more than 50 percent dependent on the timber industry. So you're hitting one strata of, of city or town or whatever you want to call it. In, and they have the no way to replace this economic impact. Uh, I don't see any in the near term, no. I mean, there's no other industry uh, uh, product that you know of that they could replace it with. If there was an easy answer to this, sir, we would probably wouldn't be sitting at this, uh, at this dais and at this hearing table. So we're going to have a lot of people on welfare? I hope not. I don't know of any other uh, answer. Perhaps we can get the title of that study and the, the author. We, we, will, we will provide that for the record. It's, it's actually an a economic book, uh, and we'll have to get that for you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, George, uh, on your statement, I think I just don't read it right, but I want to correct something for the record. On page 3, at the bottom of the uh, uh, last full paragraph that says, these sales total 1.25 million board feet in Region that, 6. That, that should be corrected to billion board feet. Billion board feet, that's correct. All right. So we also see uh, um, a reduction, as you've shown in, in your report, uh, as a result, if we follow the Thomas report in um, timber uh, within, from the Forest Service as well. Yes. And that would be reduced from uh, projected final plans in 95. 4.385 in the region to 2.619. That's correct. Uh, assuming that uh, we are successful in uh, replacing uh, that with uh, export ban legislation, uh, that gives us around, at the most, as I understand, around another 600 million, uh, which would bring it up to approximately 3.2. We're still about 1.1 billion board feet short. That, that's correct, and I think it, it needs to be understood that that uh, replacing or, or a, in placing a ban on the export of state-owned uh, timber right. results in significantly different geographic benefits and, and impacts. Uh, yeah, different areas yep. again, just like Mr. Jameson would point out. Right. So that ban isn't going to help certain areas at all because they don't have any of that right. timber in their area. It has a very minor impact on BLM. Vir virtually all of the state-owned timber that's exported is in the state of Washington. Uh, and so the benefits of, of, uh, of holding that timber in, in the country for domestic industry will primarily fall to those uh, companies that are in the uh, vicinity of the port facilities in the state of Washington. Near the Puget Sound. In the Puget Sound area, uh, generally. Right. Uh, uh, Puget Sound, Aberdeen uh, areas, and will be a relatively small benefit to the uh, firms that uh, are dependent on federal timber in southern Oregon, for example. That's correct. That's, that's what I want to get to. Then the private timber that is available, and as you point out in your statement in response to our question, there will be an increase in cuts in the private timber in the short term. We, our, our studies suggest that. We, we believe the inventory is there and that as we get a, uh, a price response caused by the shortage of uh, federal timber, that uh, there will be an increase uh, of that in the short term. But the, the inventories are not there to sustain that. And that uh, certainly uh, by the year 2000, if anything, we'll have a further reduction and we'll be, have less production on private lands than we otherwise would have if we get the price re uh, response that we are projecting. You also point out in, in your uh, statement that some of this uh, um, reduction can in the future be replaced in uh, the southeast yeah, and, we, and uh, along the uh, uh, Great Lakes. There, there will be a substantial uh, displacement as you reduce this level of supply from Pacific Northwest. Uh, probably the greatest beneficiary will be producers in Canada. Yes, I understand that, but uh, they, they uh, will produce only uh, so much again. That's right, and then the, the spillover 
goes into the uh, in the long eastern, I'm talking at the long run again that's correct uh, so we're, we're going to okay my time's expired but I want to just finish up with this what we're going to see is there's no question about it I think it's coming everybody better recognize it you're going to see a economic disruption in the Northwest there's no question I don't think it. there's any question and that there are going to be people who are going to be out of jobs out of a trade or a business that they have known all their life and their fathers and grandfathers have had, uh, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. Their children will never be able to do it. It's not going to happen for them, right? I think that's an accurate assessment. But that they could possibly find a replacement for that uh, in years to come, maybe uh, if they wanted to move uh, to Canada or to the Great Lakes or to the Southeast. I think so, and I, it seems to me that when you reach that conclusion, which I think is accurate, that uh, we have to find a, an answer to give some certainty to those communities about what their future timber supply is. At, when you, you take the reductions, then I think we des those communities deserve some assurance that will say, but now, at least for the, for the foreseeable future, whether it's a, a five year or 10 year period or whatever it may be, seems to me that we owe it to those communities for their long-term planning and adjustments to give them some certainty of supply uh, through, through perhaps a, uh, a determination by uh, the Congress that this is a, following this strategy or that uh, is a sufficient response uh, at least until we have a better level of scientific knowledge. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Morrison. I think our timer is a very, very quiet timer, so I'll be watching the clock here uh, if I can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jameson, uh, I've been listening for options here. That, that was the purpose of the hearing, but to see if we could broaden our horizons. And I want to clear up one thing. When you talked about uh, uh, broader ecosystem management, looking at this through not just the narrow focus of one particular species or one particular goal but that uh, we might come up with a system. Uh, and you indicated then for that you might need special legislative recognition or protection. I presume that includes protection for harvest. I would, that would be part of the equation in my book, yes, sir. Uh, and that we would have to then declare that uh, this particular plan satisfies the needs of X, Y, Z, a variety of, of uh, different needs, including potentially old growth timber. I think that's correct, sir, yes. So that is one legislative alternative. The other, uh, only other option that I've heard uh, really discussed would be uh, the Forest Service's uh, experimentation with the new perspectives, uh, new forestry, as some of us uh, call it. Unless I'm missing something, I sort of want to review the bidding here with where we are. I would presume that uh, both of these options that have been mentioned uh, continue to reduce the harvest. And the question is whether it's beyond the level of the Thomas report or is uh, pretty well maxes out at the level of the Thomas report. What, what, uh, what uh, under per new perspectives, Mr. Leonard or Mr. Overbay, uh, would, uh, would happen as far as old growth culture, would we leave some of these ancient trees as part of new perspectives? Yes, that's, that's the general concept is that you try to retain some of the structural characteristics from the existing old growth stand, the older trees, uh, both green and, uh, and the dead and down, uh, to carry over those characteristics so that uh, you, you uh, inoculate the the new stand with uh, some of the, the, uh, the bacteria and, and other uh, biological agents, but particularly to provide a, an early development on the structural components so that that, that stand uh, uh, within the, the framework of the rotation length you have, at least part of the, that, that period, will provide those over old growth values. Are you instructed to do this under the National Forest Management Act, or are you prohibited from doing it by the legislation that is on the books? Neither. We, we believe we have full authority under, under the National Forest Management Act to, uh, 
make those kinds of adjustments. In fact, uh, to the extent that we see that as an alternative way of dealing with the uh, maintenance of uh, uh, biological diversity, we think we have a clear uh, authorization under the National Forest Management Act to do that kind of thing. In fact, uh, Mr. Morrison, a number of our forest plans out on the West Coast have incorporated some of these principles into the prescriptions in those plans, and we are practicing that now on the Willamette Forest and the Siskiyou Forest and in, in other places out West. We uh, appreciate that experimentation. I wonder if it's gone far enough that we could convince the Congress then that these new forms of forestry can actually be adequate to protect the ecosystems that seem to be under discussion today. I'm, I might note that the Thomas Committee report recognizes this as a possible long-term solution, but at the same time said that we do not have enough experience to show that that's going to provide adequate habitat for the spotted owl, suggested that we test that and that we might be in, able to incorporate that into the management of the HCA somewhere down the road. But their current recommendation is that we not harvest at all in those areas. And that uh, presents the dilemma that uh, is the subject of today's hearing. Yeah. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the time. Thank the gentleman for staying in the allowed time. Um, uh, Congresswoman Unsold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to commend you, Mr. Leonard, on this uh, tape on new perspectives in forestry and urge all my colleagues to take the opportunity. It's, it's short, but it is very good at describing what you're attempting to accomplish in that. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about one of your somewhat emaciated stepchilds, however, a state and private forestry program, which never seems to have enough money. And if we are to have an increased uh, timber supply from some of our less than fullest productive state or county lands or even some of the private ones, uh, we probably are going to have to make an investment there, aren't we? We certainly are. You know, two-thirds of the forest land in this country is in these small non-industrial private owners that are the target okay. of the state and private uh, program. And uh, no matter what happens on the, on the federal lands, those, those lands, uh, those small ownerships are going to have to play the, the uh, the bulk of the burden of responding to the increased needs mm -hmm. of the American people as our population grows. And as we constrain the harvest on the uh, federal lands mm -hmm. as being discussed today, that role becomes all the more important. Mm -hmm. Now, it, I'm going to put this in the terms of an if clause because I don't quite have the proof yet. But if some of the state and county held lands uh, and, and some of the private that, but particularly the state and county, that were acquired out of tax default after they had been harvested at some previous time and never had intensive um, reforestation or, or management, is it likely that there would be increased future harvest if we were to be able to uh, sort of uh, start over there, harvest what we could from, from the fiber that has been produced, but then re-prepare the land and reforest in a, in, a, in a better way? I think the simple answer is yes. There, there are very substantial opportunities, again, on, on the, these small ownerships and, and some of the state lands that have, have been acquired in this to make very economic uh, investments and get a good return uh, from reforestation or other timber stand improvement me methods on these lands. Frankly, they're, they're the lands that represent the, the best growing sites. Mm -hmm. They tend to be at the lower elevations, close to the markets, yeah. uh, uh, close to the transportation system. They have some very strong natural advantages. Um, I, I regret that you've already given your testimony before appropriations. Would you consider adding a PS that in light of uh, mm -hmm the Jack Ward Thomas report in light of your economic report that you might uh, see it appropriate to have some additional funding there to improve our long-term timber supply? We, we uh, Washington, not mind that uh, yield just a minute on that point. We, we on our subcommittee have looked at this extensively, and I think that uh, <clears throat> it is not the fault of the Forest Service we have found as to the amount of funds that have been given and appropriated or at least uh, 
uh, in the budget of the President uh, for state and private forestry. I think that the gentlelady should look to OMB for that uh, uh -huh. uh, and that uh, you may be putting Mr. Leonard under some oh. constraints uh, with your question. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, we in our subcommittee plan to substantially increase Good. the amount authorized uh, for our state and private uh -huh. forestry and I'm sure that the chairman of the subcommittee who has in the past has done that will also do that. I'm, I appreciate your straightening out. I did not mean that Mr. Leonard was uh, causing this somewhat emaciated stepchild to exist, but rather I was seeking his assistance in overcoming some of the other forces. We, uh, we will have continuing dialogue over the next several months with the uh, staff of the great. Appropriations Committee on the impacts of these, these upcoming decisions. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about the in, you, you say you have the authority to institute new forestry in, in your harvest areas. Um, does, how long does it take to apply that to future sales? What, what is, is it a difficult process to alter your uh, bidding process in order to, to accommodate that management technique in future harvest? No, and, and, and as uh, Mr. Overbay indicated, we are on many forests yeah. uh, implementing that on, on sales fairly routinely. Uh, we've, we've got a transition, though, to make between uh, uh, this, this concept that we're, we're testing and truly good, well-developed management systems that carry with them their uh, uh, knowledge of the impacts on long-term growth and yield and uh, and, uh, and other factors. And so while we have been uh, encouraging our people to be innovate and try to, to use those things, it's going to be a while before we're at, at a position to specifically revise plan all of our plans to bring them in, in consistent. We have initiated a, uh, a significant research uh, program in, in the Pacific Coast, both at the uh, Pacific Northwest uh, Station and, uh, and the Southwest, in conjunction with the two regions, uh, to try to push us as rapidly as possible to getting the knowledge base to support full implementation of that concept. But you would need a legislative authority in order to apply any new forestry within the HCAs? It depends on uh, where we are in, in the process. If we're dealing with a Forest Service decision under the National Forest Management Act to develop a strategy, then uh, uh, you know, conceivably we could do it administratively. If uh, the bird is listed, uh, it becomes a little bit more complex. I, I would like to point out uh, that ba basically the scientists are telling us don't, we don't have enough information to be experimenting within the HCAs. We ought to find out whether we can keep birds, keep the owl in habitats where we practiced uh, uh, new forestry outside the HCAs and if that, if we can show that the birds thrive in that situation, then you move gradually into uh, some of the HCAs. Mr. So Smith. We got a technical problem there. Mr. Smith. I have, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit questions by Congressman Denny Smith for the record. Yes, by Congressman whom? Uh, Denny Smith. Yes, without objection, they'll be uh, submitted uh, to the uh, witnesses and uh, be made part of the record. Mr. Mr. Smith. One of the uh, benefits of being in the minority party is you get to sit on this side of the camera rather than the other side. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, uh, both agencies, uh, are you following the laws passed by Congress, uh, NEPA, FLIPMA, the National Forest Management Act, Endangered Species Act, uh, Wilderness, Parks de Designation? Etc. Are you following the laws passed by Congress? Absolutely. I think we are. Then the um, collision that we talk about here uh, uh, is not is it is not the child of uh, the president or an administration or a philosophy of uh, of the executive branch. Is that correct? That's what I, that's my opinion, yes sir. And the problem we have, I suppose, is with the laws passed by Congress, each of you, I think, has identified the point that uh, if there is to be a long-term 
decision that's going to have to be implemented by an act of Congress. Is that fair to say? I think that's true, but I, I think we are also faced with the problem that within this country uh, we have a very substantial difference of opinion about how some of our natural resources ought to be uh, managed. Uh, we have very strongly held feelings uh, that some of these resources need to be preserved and, and fully protected, and at the same time very strongly held feelings that we need to uh, utilize these to maintain our, our standard of living. And it's this uh, lack of consensus among the, uh, the public, I think, that contributes to, uh, to a great measure to the, um, the controversy and problems we're having in, in implementing the laws that are passed by Congress. Well, I, I, I think that's correct. But the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, if there's going to be a change in, in what is occurring because of the laws passed by Congress, Congress is going to have to respond by passing another law. Is that fair? I think so, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Smith, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, this is one of the unique situations where we have all three branches in the play here. We have Congress in it by establishing 318. You have the courts in it by causing Congress to establish 318. And you have the acts we're operating under as the administration. And they aren't, all, they aren't compatible yeah. in this case. And, uh, and, I, and it's not just the spotted owl. We have got to make a decision on how we want to do this. For There's a hundreds on the list that may come up in the next five to 10 years or maybe 20 that we're going to have to deal with. And so I think this is the one we ought to come to a consensus between the administration and Congress on how we really want to handle the Endangered Species Act. Well, let me get to a, a more philosophical question. If, uh, if you were not just managing public lands, if you were managing the whole timber resource in America, uh, recognizing that uh, some 41 percent of the forested lands in the Northwest are private lands, uh, I wonder how you'd respond uh, to the question uh, if you restrict uh, by 50 percent or 62 percent, relatively speaking, between BLM and Forest Service, the harvest on public lands. Uh, what kind of a strain are you going to put on uh, private lands? And are you really, are we really, placing the private lands in America, forested lands, under an extreme uh, condition which means cut out and get out uh, because of uh, the various laws uh, regarding uh, holding timber and because of the tremendous benefits that will be received by private uh, stumpage in, in prices. Are we not in a public policy manner uh, clear-cutting private lands by, this, by these kinds of actions? We're, we're certainly putting them under uh, intensive uh, pressure, uh, and the ability of our of our uh, private lands to respond and to respond in a responsive uh, and a responsible manner, I think, is is going to be challenged. I frankly like to think that the uh, the production of uh, timber on the public lands uh, with uh, agencies like the Forest Service and uh, Bureau of Land Management, who have uh, well-trained, qualified people, uh, uh, major interdisciplinary staffs uh, provide a, a, a good place to uh, produce volumes of timber uh, in a, an environmentally sound manner. And uh, that same level of production is not always available uh, in the uh, other timber producing areas, uh, uh, producing ownerships of the country, although I, I would acknowledge that uh, that many states, and particularly the states on the uh, on the Pacific Coast, have gone a long way in terms of Forest Practices Act, and states throughout the uh, country uh, have very competent and valuable uh, forestry organizations that can provide assistance to private landowners. Well, uh, just a statement. I'll finish, Mr. Chairman. It, it just seems an anomaly to me that while there are those who who are are adamantly uh, uh, pursuing. Uh, the, uh, the preservation of, a, of an endangered species and thereby uh, taking out of production huge amounts of public lands for the protection of old growth, the result may well be that we are going to put great pressure on private lands, which two-thirds of them, as Mr. Blended mentioned, uh, two-thirds of the forests are in private lands. We are advancing a policy to eliminate forests on private lands. 
Can I add one thing, Mr. Chairman, before yes, us? One important one point that hasn't been mentioned in the equation on private lands, which I think the committee should be aware of, is that the Endangered Species Act applies there too. And, and I was uncomfortable, to be honest with you, with the numbers that were in our report of the, the amount of employment that would be picked up in 1995. We've gained 12,000 some odd jobs uh, by the industry shifting to the private lands. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that number. I think with, if you factor in, I don't think that number had the Endangered Species Act factored into it. And nor, at least in the BLM areas of, uh, of Oregon, I don't think there's that much available on private lands. So I think if you, yes. you have to take consideration the Endangered Species Act for private lands also. Nor did it have factored in the revamping of the Resource Management Plan or the Forest Management Plan to... Mr. Leonard, uh, my colleagues, Mr. Morrison and Ms. Unsold both brought up the issue of new forestry or new perspectives in forestry, and I'm, and I'm, I'm glad that they did, and I think that uh, idea will play an important role in, in resolving the problems that we face. But tell me this, do, do you have any scientists at the present time who would say that uh, implementation of new forestry by itself would be adequate to protect uh, ancient forest ecosystems as, as viable ecological systems? Do you have any evidence to suggest I, that at the present time? I, I think that uh, this, we have a number of scientists who believe that through management we can carry substantial portions of mm -hmm. the uh, ecological values associated with the ancient forest through into, into managed okay. stands. But, but all of them recognize that preservation has an important role and part of a overall strategy of uh, managing those ecosystems, particularly as you look at it on a sure. landscape basis. Sure. Well, I think that's important. I think we ought to, to pursue both. Uh, we, we have had a fair amount of discussion this morning about preserving viable species compared to and managing for species compared to managing for, for ecological systems. Um, and uh, uh, we, we know that it's, it's difficult, uh, apparent, uh, based on the recommendations at least of the interagency committee to, to meet the requirements that they have uh, said are necessary to manage for the viability of, of the spotted owl, that that will not be an easy thing to do. Uh, the impacts will be very serious. But tell me this, would, would my understanding be correct that it would probably be more difficult to manage for the maintenance of a functioning ecological system than it would be for one species? Is that an incorrect assumption on my part? I, I think that uh, it requires a, a broader knowledge of the functioning of the ecosystem uh, and it's easier to, to zero in and, and it's easier we, to zero in on the requirements of an individual mm -hmm. species. But in, mm -hmm. in dealing with that individual species uh, and not having a, a full understanding of the uh, ecological impacts, we may very well uh, be causing problems elsewhere in the uh, ecosystem. Yeah, but but so, so you would say that, that it is, is probable that uh, managing to protect the viability of the system is going to be more complicated, more difficult than simply achieving the objective of, of managing for the viability of one species. If, you only, if you're only dealing with one species, that's probably true. Yes. But, uh, in, in none of our ecosystems, in none of our forests, are we simply dealing with a single species. Yes, We're but to maintain the viability of a system, Mr. Johnson, it I think would be more difficult than to maintain the viability of just one species because the system is the product of a number of species and their interrelationships. Is, is that correct? That's, that's true, but I think it's important to recognize that the spotted owl was selected as an indicator species of the health of old growth ecosystems and there are other species that benefit from those ecosystems. If we manage for spotted owl viability, we are also providing values for other species. I, I agree completely, and I think that NFA, NFA requires us to do that. But I'm a little disturbed uh, about the idea here this morning that, uh, that uh, somehow uh, uh, we're now managing uh, to maintain the viability of, of, of ecological systems when, in fact, we're struggling even to uh, understand what is necessary to maintain the, the viability of, of, of one species. And uh, I, I don't think it's impossible to, to, do, to do both, but 
I am hoping that the agencies involved will, uh, will get the information that they need and address that question straightforward. Now, Mr. Uh, Leonard, on, on page 7 of your statement, you, you point out that science uh, can't provide uh, the answers that we need that, that, that they are policy questions. And to some extent, I, I think that's true. But don't you think we can make better use of, of science? Don't you think part of what got us into this problem was that your agency ignored the advice of its own scientists uh, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, did not uh, seek uh, their um, counsel or at least their, uh, the information that they have to provide uh, so that you would have an understanding that would allow you to meet the requirements of, of NMFA? Don't you think that's been part of the problem? Well, uh, certainly we, we, we all wish we'd started uh, some of our scientific uh, work uh, long ago and we had better answers. Uh, I would point out, though, that uh, the Forest Service uh, as, as evidenced by one of the ne next witness, uh, Dr. Franklin, has been investing in this area uh, for a long time. Uh, and I recognize his, his contribution career, and, in my and opening it's statement. It's been supported but, by, by the agency for a long time. And that's very much appreciated. I guess my point to summarize is this. The centerpiece of my legislation is the idea that we ought to get the nation's preeminent forest ecologists and other scientists who have as much understanding as man now possesses about how forest ecosystems function as viable, sustainable units. And we ought to ask them for their advice, and we ought to solicit their recommendations in terms of what may be necessary to protect ecological systems as viable, functioning units. And I don't know how we can make a rational decision about how to maintain these systems without that information. And I would encourage you to, to look at whatever means it is. Perhaps my legislation isn't the right means to, to obtain that input. But the Congress uh, and the agency, I think, desperately needs to uh, have that uh, advice and desperately needs to listen to what we know about functioning systems. Uh, because to craft any solution short of that knowledge is going to guarantee that somewhere down the road we're going to have to rethink the whole thing. And I appreciate the patience of the chairman in allowing me uh, to go beyond got, my time. Uh, I think our timer is working better now, but I'm trying to be indulgent as uh, most of us transgressed a little bit, so I appreciate my colleagues uh, understanding that. Uh, Mr. DeFazio, member of the subcommittee. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess, uh, you know, I was sitting here doing some computations as we went through this one I hadn't done before, and I guess I can say that the people of my district are both uh, very blessed in terms of having uh, fabulous uh, forest uh, resources right uh, on our doorsteps. And we're also cursed in that uh, the uh, proposed Thomas report and the economic impacts and the harvest reductions, 45 percent of the harvest reductions recommended on the 17 national forests and uh, six BLM districts in a three-state region, 45 percent of those reductions are in one congressional district. That's mine. Uh, I know so, that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, if uh, we didn't put them there, though, we well, I, I understand. <laughs> the powers beyond us did that, so I, I, I understand. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, we can work on a solution. I, just in response to the, the last uh, statements by uh, by my colleague, Mr. Johns, you know, the last time we came up uh, to this problem uh, was because the Monongahela decision, the National Forest Management Act, was a result. And at that time, I think that uh, we did have what was as much understanding and input as the scientists we could have uh, as humans. And I don't think anything we adopt in Congress here dealing with old growth ecosystems and the spotted owl is going to be immutable or even uh, necessarily that enduring. At some point, it's going to be a judgment call and a best guess. Uh, and that's, I think, perhaps where some of the statements come in today in terms of sufficiency in that. I mean, we are never going to know for certain. Uh, and we just can't, uh, but certainly we have to listen to all the advice we can get. And I tell you, there's no shortage of advice uh, these days. I spend a lot of time listening and talking. Um, George, uh, I, 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 I wish the Chief had come uh, because I, I meant to ask him about this last time, it was before hearing, but I, I've got to ask you now because the, the, the direction we're going in here seems me to lead me to believe that the administration needs to propose a solution, and as 
the system works, Congress will then dispose and uh, you know work our will and then send it back to the president for his final acknowledgement or his or his disapproval. Uh, I don't think Congress is is necessarily the place to formulate the proposal, uh, given the employees and the expertise that the management agencies have. Uh, but I'm disturbed uh, that the chief came to my district on 315.90 and uh, headline, front page of the paper, uh, people kind of wonder what I'm doing here, I guess, because the forest chief says no new laws are needed. It's not necessary to have new legislative action in order to carry forward in the management of these forests, said Dale Robertson. Um, has the chief changed his position uh, since that time? Uh, is the chief uh, going to be making a proposal uh, to uh, the administration uh, or directly to Congress, however the administration, since he doesn't have an assistant secretary, to carry it? Uh, perhaps the chief himself uh, would carry it. Uh, can we expect uh, a proposal to Congress, uh, something that will include some of the elements you've talked about today, uh, Mr. Leonard, including uh, you know, sufficiency and uh, new perspectives and management. I mean, you're, in your testimony when you talk about the balanced approach, I mean, can we expect something to come forward or, or are we just going to have to live with whatever comes out of Fish and Wildlife and the Thomas Report? The administration is very concerned about the impacts of the, uh, uh, that our economic study showed of, uh, of implementing the thing and the impacts of the potential uh, listing uh, we've reviewed that with OMB, with the Domestic Policy Council, the Council of uh, Staff, the, uh, those, those groups, the Council on Economic Advisors. Uh, just about every uh, organization within the White House has been involved in, in looking at this and, and, and looking some options. I can't tell you today that they're coming through with a proposal, but they're certainly trying to, uh, to come up with some answers and to come forth with a, a proposal. But that, yeah. you know, I can't tell you today that they, in fact, will. Um, well, what do we do on October 1st, well, 1990, the, the, when the 318 expires? Well, you know, what, what I think the chief was saying uh, out there is that uh, Congress has, has spoken. It's told us what to do, and we have the authorities to uh, carry out what Congress told us to do. We have the authority to, uh, to deal with the... Uh, Interagency Scientific Committee report to revise our uh, decisions for that regional guide and to amend the forest plans. Uh, but at some point, you've got to have an opinion, and the chief has to have an opinion. Do you think this is reasonable? Do you think it's necessary, no. I, you know, to, to go through this this degree of job loss and dislocation? Are there alternatives that are preferable? If so, if they would require a change in the authority of the Forest Service, will you recommend one? That's that's the bottom line. You don't have to say we're just playing the hand we've been dealt. You know, I, I mean, you know, you can ask for a new deal. The answer is that we do not, at this time, propose to ask for a new deal in terms of uh, revision of the Endangered Species Act or other... Uh, no, I'm, I'm not even talking about what about back to if, if the chairman would indulge me since the other members and since I'm so affected uh, had a little extra time. What, 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 you're, uh, what you're leading toward here... Uh, I mean, how about I'll give you a suggestion and you respond, since I, I can't seem to get the administration to make any suggestions. What would you think of legislating the forest plans? You've spent 10 years doing them. Uh, what if you put them in final form and you think that recognizes all existing laws and concerns about the forests? There doesn't seem to be any sort of, you know, it, it, the question I always have is what do we do with the forest plans when we're done because what we know now is they're going to be litigated for years by both sides, the industry and the environmental groups, and there'll be no certainty. How do we get to certainty? The only way I can see to get to certainty is to legislate the forest plans. Would you recommend that? I'll give you my personal... Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. My, my personal opinion, and that is that uh, uh, because of the level of uh, concern in the Pacific Northwest and that the differences of, of view over what those forests are going to be uh, managed for, that unless we have some, whether it's legislated the plan or uh, some sort of sufficiency language such as was done in the uh, wilderness area, that uh, we will have no certainty of supply, we'll have no ability to fully implement those plans in a rational time frame. And the, as I indicated earlier, the communities in the Pacific Northwest, I think, uh, 
we're going to reduce the supply uh, in the ranges that we've been talking about, certainly are entitled to a level of certainty as to where the management of those forests are, are, are done. And I don't see anything short of uh, some sort of congressional action uh, to assure that that's going to happen. And if we don't have plans, we don't really look at the proper management of the other values other than the owl and or the owl as it may relate to old growth, because Thomas we, doesn't necessarily just preserve old we've growth. We've got to go a long ways beyond just dealing with the owl and then these immediate questions on old growth. There's, there's all kinds of things about how we manage river corridors and travel corridors and whether we build ski areas and uh, a lot of things that go beyond the, the narrow things we've been talking about here today. Okay, thank you. I, I realize my time has expired. I, 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 in the next round, I'll get, I mean, I don't mean to neglect the BLM. Uh, Mr. Jameson, you're, you're so important in my district, but I'll, we'll get it to a similar round of questions. We're, we're, right. we're going you, to have Mr. a second round of questions, but unfortunately, some of our colleagues, Mr. Bosco, you can, I assume can return after the vote, and, uh, and Mr. Uh, McDermott, others can. So rather than get, uh, you cannot return. <laughs> Ms. Schneider, we want to observe your presence. Do you have any questions for the witnesses very briefly? Very brief question. Yes, okay. very brief well, question. Let's recognize you. Uh, <laughs> you uh, as a member of the Science Research and Technology Committee, in addition to the Merchant Marine and Fisheries uh, Committee that has jurisdiction over endangered species, one of the things that is becoming more and more a topic of scientific undertakings is an assessment of ecosystem-wide uh, studies, and it seems to me that it is very difficult to get a benchmark assessment as to what kind of appropriate management we should be involved in, not only when it comes to old growth, but clearly when it comes to ecosystems as a whole. And I think that it is important to share with you the, the sentiment of so much of the scientific community that we're not doing a good job unless we do do an ecosystem-wide assessment. That's one point that I wanted to make. And the other thing that I just wanted to share with the gentlemen who are testifying today and determining to what degree is it the role of the federal government to concern itself with the, the economic impact. I think that I just uh, a short while ago came from a bipartisan coalition of reformers. And let me say to you that these reformers who are anxious to reduce our deficit are coming up with ways we cut back on agricultural subsidies, we cut back on energy subsidies, that we change the status quo. And in doing that, we are going to see some different fluctuations in jobs. And I feel that clearly it is the responsibility of the federal government to do such assessments and to say, look, if you're not going to be a logger, then what are your other options? So we can't just stick in our heels and say, no, we will not change. We must look at the world changing around us and see what role the federal government can play in helping to facilitate that change. Because we are in a global economy. We're dealing not only in that global economy, but we're doing, working in a global environment with ecosystems that have a great deal of relevance, relevance beyond the narrow borders. So I just wanted to share those few points with you, but uh, I do regret I will not be able to come back later on. And if there is anyone that chooses to continue this dialogue with me, please know that I have an enormous amount of interest, but I'm um, very anxious of moving beyond discussion into some action. Thank you. The uh, subcommittee will recess uh, until the conclusion of the vote, and we'll uh, return uh, to continue the questioning of the witnesses. Well, I'd just like to uh, uh, ask uh, Mr. Jameson, uh, one of the things I didn't get to because my time ran out, in page 7, on page 7 of your statement, you point out that the 521 million board feet offered thus far in the fiscal year 1990, 410 million board feet are about 80 percent has been protested. Does that mean appeals have been followed, yes, filed sir. on those sales? Yes, sir. What is the process on those appeals? What is the, where are we in the status of those? Uh, yeah. uh, we analyzed the, uh, the appeal, and within 30 days, if we rule the appeal has merit, we continue, and if we, do, if we don't, we go ahead with the sale. Well, what I'm wondering is, uh, where are we on those appeals? Where, are we within that 30 days, or has some of those expired, and you're going on with the sales, or uh, it's continuous. are you negotiations on some of them, or what, what are uh, we? I guess the answer is, is all of the above, but we, it's continuous that uh, we have, as we offer sales, they usually are appealed immediately. Uh, and we go through the protest on them, uh, normally oper operates about 30 days. And if we find that the appeal does not have merit, 
Well, we issue that decision and go and the sale is, is, is going ahead with. Well, you've been through this before. This isn't the first time you've had an appeal on the sale. Oh, yeah. All right. Now, uh, as a result, you got some idea of approximately of this uh, uh, 400 million, uh, 410 million board feet that's on appeal, approximately how much do you think will be delayed and not be able to be sold in 1990? You got any idea at all? Well, we'd hopefully that, uh, the, uh, Chairman Volkman, most of the, the ones out there are our best ones to stay out of the owl issue. Right. And that's our best shot. I would assume that most of the appeals will be turned down and we'll go ahead with them. Okay, so I don't have to concern myself that we're going to lose maybe half. No, I don't think so, sir. All right. Okay, and those sales will probably be uh, finalized and offered before October 1. Yeah, our goal is still to meet the requirements of 318. All right. Uh, George, I'd like for you to comment. I know it has nothing to do with the Northwest. But some, uh, it's something that has uh, struck me as maybe some inconsistencies that uh, the gentleman from Oregon had brought out, maybe some inconsistencies as we apply the laws that we have on the books. And down in East Texas and in the Southeast, we are trying to preserve the rec red cockaded woodpecker, wood woodpecker. And it has caused some problems. There have been some things down there. Now, I understand that in East Texas, we have a problem on part of the wilderness area. Is that correct? That's correct. And that uh, some of this wilderness area is highly diseased with the uh, pine beetle? Yes. Southern pine beetle, yes. Southern pine beetle. And one of the ways to protect the uh, area for the red cockaded woodpecker is to destroy those trees that are infested. Is that correct? That's correct. And that means that you have to go on the wilderness to destroy those trees and that we have now people who are objecting to that activity, correct? That is correct. So you're trying to do something for the red cockaded woodpecker, and, but because it's on wilderness area, you're are having objection filed to doing it. That's, that's correct. In fact, a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, had, had a similar situation there in, in Texas, and we're, we're stopped by uh, lawsuits and appeals and since that time, we've completed a, a new environmental impact statement, and uh, we, we believe we've got all our procedural uh, steps taken. And now, uh, while we've been challenged, we've been successful in, uh, in going ahead and carrying out those uh, insect suppression activities in order to protect the woodpecker. All right. I have no further questions. Does the gentleman from New York have any questions at all? If not, we're going to recess again, make this vote. We'll be back. Uh, if we don't have another vote, we should be in another 10 minutes. Uh, if there is another vote, it will probably be about another 15 or 20 minutes. Mr. Chairman, if I, uh, if I could uh, call your attention, uh, uh, Mr. Overbay is due in, uh, for another hearing over on the Senate side at 2 o'clock, so he'll have to uh, move over there, and I'll, but I'll remain here. Whenever, if he has to leave now, grab a bite to eat and get over there, uh, yes, almost 1 o'clock, I'd suggest uh, we'll uh, excuse Mr. Overbay. Thank you. Thank you. C-SPAN's coverage of this hearing on timber harvesting in old growth forests will continue in just a moment. Monday on C-SPAN. We'll examine events in the news with special guests Paul Jagot from the Wall Street Journal and Hendrik Hertzberg of the New Republic. Phone in with your questions and comments on current events. Monday beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific Time. Coming up next, we return to Thursday's Congressional Oversight Hearing on Timber Harvesting and Old Growth Forests. Lawmakers heard from federal officials, scholars, forest economists, and representatives from environmental groups, including the National Audubon Society and the National Wildlife Federation. The witnesses appeared at a joint meeting of the House Interior Subcommittee on National Parks and Public Lands, the Merchant Marine Subcommittee on Fisheries and Wildlife Conservation, and the Agriculture Subcommittee on forests. But the good news is we're probably done for the day in terms of votes. So uh, the only interruptions now will be uh, those that uh, uh, for the uh, various schedule. I still don't have the right mic on. I got the wrong mic. So I think probably could all hear my squeaky little voice anyway. 
<laughs> you have a time problem, Sai? Could I uh, be excused about 2.30 if it's possible? Yeah, I think that that uh, would be, that we appreciate your, the time that you've allocated and I'm certain that, that would be a, a, a satisfactory and I'll uh, alert the others, uh, other members to it as they come in. So I, I regret you, that we've had this series of votes, but as I said, it was unavoidable. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bosco is, uh, is uh, ready and waiting, and Mr. Bosco is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leonard, uh, your testimony posits the scenario that uh, although some, as I recall, uh, what, some 25,000 jobs would be lost in the Pacific Northwest on, due to Forest Service cutbacks alone, uh, you felt that, or your computer models indicated that some of this could be made up on private lands. Um, are you under the impression that the various laws that apply to the Forest Service, such as the Endangered Species Act, the Water Quality Act, the variety of laws, don't apply to private lands and that therefore they would be free to um, uh, take, uh, absorb this uh, increase in cut? I'm certainly not under that impression. Uh, all those laws uh, apply to private land. Uh, we, we believe that uh, as you look at the area that's affected, that there are, uh, that are, there are inventories of timber. Our, our inventories on private, private lands show that there is, is the ability for those, for, for those uh, owners to respond uh, within the framework of laws that, that exist. And remember, our, our study is the impact of, uh, imp of implementing the conservation strategy on federal lands. And it doesn't anticipate uh, a listing of the owl. If, it, if the owl is listed, then you'd have to do a new economic impact study. This was just of implementing the study on, on federal lands. We think there are some opportunities. Now, if we're wrong, then the, the uh, the uh, total impacts will come on, uh, as I indicated during my testimony, the impacts will come on in a shorter interval than we had uh, indicated. Well, I know that virtually every timber harvest plan on private lands in California is taken to court now and under ver very much the same statutes that we're dealing with here. I, th I would suggest that whoever is doing your computer modeling uh, should take that into account because it doesn't do much good to somebody who's losing a job to say, oh, well, go next door and get a job when next door there aren't any jobs. Um, secondly, what would have your computers and biologists and others figured out what will be the effect of the spotted owl on private lands if, if in fact, uh, there is increased cut on private lands? Uh, no, we haven't. Our jurisdiction is the, uh, is the national forest and our evaluations have all dealt with national forest land. It's hard, really hard for me to believe that, uh, that we are in a situation where the goal is presumably to save this owl from becoming extinct and in effect we're saying on the federal lands we will make plans to uh, cr prevent its extinction, but we're going to suggest increased harvest on the private lands, which will cut back on the uh, population of spotted owls on the private lands. I mean, I don't think anything could be more preposterous than that sort of a plan. Mr. I mean, Bosco, how, can, how can we be expected to have any credibility when we're all day long here, we're talking about ecosystems and the totality of everything, and you're saying uh, that let's depend more on private lands and we know full well that the spotted owl will be hurt on private lands if we do depend more on them. Mr. Bosco, we don't have a plan for increasing harvest on, on private land, uh, nor do, do we, uh, are we advocating an increased harvest on private lands. What we're saying is that historically in the Pacific Northwest and around the country, when the price increases, private landowners increase the harvest of timber. And what we're, are, we're saying is that the, the inventory does in fact exist on the private lands of Oregon, Washington, and California 
to sustain a higher level of harvest in the short term. And uh, we indicated that, that within a very few years that would be used up. But there are private landowners that can put their timber on, on the market. And uh, we think that if the price incentive is great enough, some of them will. Now, as I indicated in my testimony, there are people in the timber industry that disagree with that, that, no, they're, that are currently trying to buy some of that private timber and are not being successful. And if they're right, then the impacts, instead of coming uh, over a 10-year period, will come in over the next uh, three to five years. Well, you've mentioned that $148 million will be lost to the Federal Treasury if the, this report is implemented. During what period of time is that? That's, that's an annual loss. So $148 million per year uh, if we were to extrapolate out a hundred years, which is the period of time that we're bringing these owls back on, and were to save 500 pair of owls or a thousand owls, that's 14.8 million dollars per owl that'll be paid for by the American taxpayer. That's just the the public cost of this. To say nothing of the private profits, the private jobs. I think that's a, if you wanted to look at the, uh, the total cost of the public, it would be greatly uh, in excess of that. The total cost of the public would be greatly in excess of that. That's a pretty heavy price, I would think, for this game plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, begin uh, second round. And uh, I, after I ask my questions, I'm asked to, uh, either Mr. Volkmer or Mr. DeFazio to assume the chair. The, um, you know, the real, the real key here, I think, uh, uh, too, is, uh, Mr. Leonard, is uh, whether or not, uh, for instance, and I heard you say specifically and Mr. Turner say specifically that the, you're not seeking any amendments, the administration is not seeking any amendments to the Endangered Species Act. Is that right? Yes. And, and I, I can't commit the, to the, the administration won't seek yes, an amendment I mean, sometime, at the, current but at the present time. time the present time, that's not one of the. Well, uh, Mr. Turner said that he would not uh, support uh, such uh, uh, proposals, and we had the uh, the, the Ward Thomas hearing uh, on the inter uh, agency task force uh, study. And Mr. Jamison, you concur in that? Well, yes. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if the votes about. I think my memory serves me right. It was 400 to 35 on reauthorization. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of support for changing the act. No, I don't. I, I agree. I mean, I'm not. Uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm just. Uh, I'm just. Uh, you know, we're trying to look at what the solutions are. Let me just ask another question. Uh, uh, you know, as we look at timber supplies and so forth, we've had a number of laws that affect it uh, on the export administration. It seems to me that uh, on the export administration, on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, the issue uh, with regards to uh, uh, the log export uh, uh, matter that the administration sought no changes in that law. Is that correct, Mr. Leonard? That's correct. Although uh, that's uh, that's an option that's uh, in the in the issues that were before the administration. Well, we're looking at, we know, we know what the history is. You see, I keep hearing about how bad this problem is, but I don't, I'm kind of looking to hear if I can hear, well, how do you propose to help, uh, what are you suggesting to solve it? And uh, 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 so uh, the, there is no change proposed there. There are other acts like the Jones Act, which bar Alaskan timber in the lower 48. Is the administration considering any changes to that? Mr. Leonard. Currently, I, I know of no uh, consideration of that. Uh, if we were to uh, uh, to deal with that, uh, the impact uh, would be both good and bad, I guess, in the Pacific Northwest. I'm well aware of that. Uh, but uh, it could provide some uh, uh, old growth uh, uh, timber for some of the mills in the Northwest as well. Is that correct? That's 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 correct. Although it there's also an issue on old growth harvesting in Alaska as well, of course. Well, I understand that. Of course, I, I think that, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we, in other words, that's going forward, I guess, that doesn't seem to me to be tied up in litigation right at this moment Not in quite the, the same manner that the, and of course, there's some questions about the Forest Service uh, policy or the congressional policy with regards to the Tongass that is, of course, being uh, recommended. Now, 
the uh, uh, the schedule for the forest management plan, in other words, uh, the uh, there has been no uh, adjustment for any of these uh, these new studies or the any type of threatened and endangered species uh, uh, programs uh, in the forest management plans. In other words, uh, they do not recognize, for instance, new forestry. Is that correct, Mr. Leonard? A number of the the plans that are that are currently coming on uh, online do, in fact, make. Uh, provision for uh, new forestry techniques. The, the Siskiyou plan, for example, that uh, was recently uh, approved uh, uh, recognizes the desirability of uh, applying uh, new forestry techniques. Virtually all of the uh, forest plans in the Pacific Northwest, in fact, all of the forest plans in the, in the Pacific Northwest uh, specifically make provision for ret uh, retaining uh, standing dead trees and, and down trees. So some of the concepts of new forestry are reflected in most plans, but none of them fully, uh, uh, fully implement the concepts as they're being currently developed. And when I asked question three and the Forest Service answered it, it says, do you see any need for legislation to implement a long-term solution to the result of conflicts between old growth, uh, preservation, and timber harvest? You didn't answer the question here. It says, the implementation of the spotted all habitat protection plan suggested by the ISC would have traumatic short-term I believe it is time to provide these timber dependent uh, areas a measure of certainty and supply. What does that mean? Well, <laughs> it, I think it means what I was, was indicating earlier, that we can muddle through and come up with plans on, uh, on how to implement <clears throat> this. Whether we can, in a, in a reasonable time, implement those plans, giving, uh, given the, the almost certainty of environmental challenges because of the dis the, the level of debate out in the Northwest, uh, I think that uh, that some some congressional action to to find that plan sufficient or some other plan sufficient may be essential if we're going to give that level of certainty to the yeah, uh, Mr. Jamison. I was listening to you and our colleague from uh, Oregon, Mr. Smith, talk about uh, uh, Congress and writing laws. Do you acknowledge any role here on the part of the administration in terms of writing laws or policies? Yes, and I, and I think that that's, that's the point I was making, is that uh, it's always, you know, the administration give us a proposal. Well, in this short time frame that we're going to be working on it, I think we have to kind of come to co a consensus before we actually put a proposal on the, on the table. Because I could go back and come up with some, uh, some idea for an for a answer to Jack Ward Thomas or a different plan or who knows what. But if it doesn't have a chance of flying, are we really using our resources in the correct and proper manner? I would say no. And so what I'm saying is that I'm going to try to get some other factors that I can bring up to you and say, here are some other options we may have. Do you want to take a look at it? Well, and if it is, we may have a plan together. Well, I appreciate <laughs> that, uh, Mr. Jamison. But, you know, I think members of Congress, Mr. Johnson and others, are going to put in proposals. And uh, uh, obviously, they're getting uh, a uh, pretty critical uh, review. They're getting critiqued. I don't mean uh, necessarily only critical. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, obviously I think the administration of, uh, of proposals uh, should be a subject to the light of day. Don't you agree? And, and they will be. Uh, well, they only will be if they're made. I mean, so far I don't remember the administration proposing anything on the 318. Uh, uh, in other words, that was not something that was initiated by the administration. I guess in frustration we ended up in the appropriation process. Is that, is that, is that the wish of the administration this year to end up in the, in the appropriation process again? I don't, think, I don't think that's the proper approach. And, if, and if, if you were listening to what we were trying to say, is the, it's bigger than the owl. Well, and when 318, excuse me, 318 was, it was a quick fix for two states, basically. And it fixed Washington and Oregon for a, for a cutting period, and that was just the owl. I think it's bigger than that. I think whether it's a desert tortoise, it may be the salmon, that might be another critical species that's coming out, it had nothing to do with the BLM and the Forest Service that time. Those are things that we're going to have to look, on, look at and see how we want to handle them as a nation, not just the Northwest. And not just the thing. I think when we looked at the, in 318, that was a fix for a local community, local two states. Well, I think that uh, we don't need to expand Excuse me, this three, problem. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah 318, Mr. I'm Mr. sorry. Mr. Bosco, I apologize. I may have said it 218. Oh, it didn't but, uh, Excuse the, me, you're uh, out of my that. time has expired, <laughs> and I recognize a gentleman from uh, uh, Washington, Mr. Morrison, and I'd ask Mr. DeFazio to assume the chair.
Mr. Chairman, I think uh, for the sake of getting through the program today, I will uh, uh, visit with these gentlemen in my office. So I yield back my time. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Unsold. Thank you. If, if you gentlemen will answer very briefly my questions, uh, it will save you having me nag you for written responses in the future. Uh, Mr. Fay, would you, uh, is there any incompatibility between the species management and ecosystem management? I, I would say no, and at least in terms of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it may not be generally recognized, but the Endangered Species Act is explicitly an ecosystem directed plan. And in fact, I, I'd like to quote from the Statement of Purpose in the Endangered Species Act. Purposes of this act are to provide a means whereby the ecosystems upon which endangered species and threatened species depend may be conserved. Uh, and that, we in the Fish and Wildlife Service at least, take that as our charge under the Endangered Species Act. It is not, there is no essential inconsistency or dichotomy between species okay. management and ecosystem now, management. Now, I've, I've just heard a lot about the sky falling in and it's going to keep on falling in and that you're just dealing with the hand that you were dealt. Uh, however, it's, in, in my view, uh, you not only uh, shuffled the cards and, and dealt them, but previously you marked them because aren't we where we are because of the plans under which we've been operating that you all have created um, and and uh, why are you trying to distance yourself from the very plans that you have made that have gotten us to where we are? I want to give you a very brief answer. The answer is that you're incorrect, and the answer is no. These are, w w we do not face a spotted owl issue or an ecosystem issue because of the plans under which you folks have been operating the forest for these years? Uh, if you take BLM, we operate under two laws. One's the ONC Act that requires us to pr uh, produce timber. Yeah. That is a basic requirement of the Act. Actually, in FLIPMA, if you read FLIPMA, FLIPMA uh, gives standing or takes the ONC Act that says that our purpose out there is to produce timber. All right. Okay, we're doing that. And that's under the law. No matter, and our plans are made from that law uh -huh. and incorporated in, to the extent possible, FLIPMA, which is multiple use management. All right, so you are saying that part of your charge is not an environmentally sustainable produ production of timber. Ours is to, uh, the act, ONC Act says it's on a sustained yield basis. We can sustain the, the timber coming off there and regenerate but, it. But you see that only as fiber and not ecosystem. In the past that was true and okay. I think we're moving more in towards you, the issue that you brought up. Yes. You're being pulled along in there. Uh, Mr. That's Leonard? Right. Well, First, I, b I believe that our forest plans are the best effort that's ever been made to find a, a rational course between the, uh, the competing demands that are put on our, our forest. And we're not backing off those plans. We, we think we ought to go ahead and implement them. Now, we've got some new scientific information that suggests the strategy we had for spotted owls uh, is inadequate. We've got to go back and uh, and integrate that information with our forest plans. And that, that means not just overlay that on top of the plans. We've got to go back, as, uh, as uh, right. Chairman Vinto suggested, and, and relook at, at a number of aspects of those plans to, uh, again, and, find a, strike that rational balance. And in regard to that, under Section 318B, um, 6B, where you are directed uh, to acquire, uh, consider any new information gathered subsequent to the issuance of the record of decision and uh, the, the uh, guidelines for conservation of northern spotted owls developed by the Interagency Scientific Committee. What are you going to do along that line? What is the President going to do who talks about uh, balanced jobs and owls in fulfilling this? I can't tell you what the President's going to do. I can tell you what the Forest Service is going to do. All right. uh, Absent listing, we will revise our decision on the spotted owls consistent with the scientific information that we've, uh, we've gathered uh, or, or that we have from the Interagency Scientific Committee and based on the additional uh, uh, inventory work that we've been doing out there. We have literally hundreds of uh, people out there calling owls, for example, today. Mm -hmm. And 
and Based as on, part of a public process? And, and uh, it will all be done in an open public process, yes. Now, this one, you may not ha I may not have time enough for you to answer, and I would ask you to follow it up, because you seemed so pessimistic in your proposals, and I, I, I don't like to believe in a conspiracy theory, but it really sounded like trying to make things as bad as possible, and I know they are, but I feel that there are positive things that we can do to approach the future. So how can the For National Forest Service help these communities uh, on coming up with some Northwest strategies, programs, high value products, state and private forestry, new forestry, uh, and g give us some ideas. Because we don't want our communities to disappear or move to Canada. And, and we, we absolutely agree. We don't want to, to uh, those communities to disappear. We want the management of the National Forest to be an asset to those communities. We want to be a good neighbor and we want uh, to contribute to the economic viability of uh, the Northwest and to those individual communities that make up that, uh, that area. That's why we initiated the, what's known as the Northwest Strategy, to find ways to utilize the resources of those forests to, to get a more diversified economy. Uh, we are, we do believe that through our state and private program, we can increase the contribution that are made uh, by the state forest, not only in the field of just producing timber, but in the total uh, multiple use of those kinds of uh, forests. And, uh, you know, we've, we've demonstrated, I think, that the mm -hmm. technical assistance through the state foresters can be effective in this, uh, this area. We intend to continue to, uh, to work on those programs. Given the magnitude of the uh, consequences, we think that, uh, that other agencies, the state governments and, and other agencies, the federal government, will also have to play a role uh, in that process. But I, I do appreciate your adding that because it was not contained in your written a Thank lot you. of that in your written statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Johns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leonard, I want to ask for your help in, in clarifying some figures that you used in your report, or your testimony, rather. On page three, uh, you suggest that the figures for reductions in uh, timber sales or harvest levels from current levels on federal lands uh, containing spot owl habitat in Oregon, Washington, California would be 48 percent. And uh, then on page four, you suggest that part of that would be a result of the adoption of the plans. Yes. Now, how much of that would be the plans and how much of that would be the owls on top of the plans? Let me switch the focus, if I could, just a little bit to just Oregon and Washington, because I have those, those numbers in my mind. And, and I'll, I'll step down. For the last uh, three years or so, 87, 88, and 89, our harvest of uh, timber from the, the National Forest in Oregon and Washington has been in uh, 5 billion board feet or more. In fact, in 87, it was 5.7 billion board feet. We were able to harvest at that, that level this last three years because earlier in the decade, the harvest were well below uh, uh, what was the, our, our estimated uh, potential harvest. The draft forest plans, which we have uh, uh, had on the street for the last uh, two to three years, which represented a uh, what we thought was a, a balanced program, uh, aggregated to about 4, point, 4 billion board feet net scale, about a 4.7 billion uh, potential gross volume uh, program. As we've moved from uh, draft to final forest plans, and uh, about half of them are out in final form, and the, and the, the rest were at, at close enough to getting final that we can predict what those finals would be, uh, we see that 4 billion feet dropping down to uh, uh, the neighborhood of 3.7, 3.8 uh, billion board feet, which uh, then translates into a total sale program of 4.4 to 4.5 billion board feet. If uh, you take the, the spotted owl guidelines 
take the map of suitable, ha suitable lands that were going to be managed for timber production under those final plans and the projected final plans, add the spotted owl impact on that, it reduces that program down to uh, the allowable sale quantity down into the neighborhood of 2.5, 2.6 billion board feet, which would allow us a uh, total sale program then in the neighborhood of 3 billion board feet. So the, the, the direct impact in Oregon and Washington uh, associated with, the, uh, with just adding the Interagency Scientific Committee report to where we thought we think we'll come out with forest plans absent that that report is about 800 million board feet. Well, it, it seems to me in your testimony, both with regard to uh, the level of harvest as well as the jobs, you you seem to to mix things up between the plans and and the owl report, and and uh, I, I would yeah, we, I would just suggest that that if you're if you're supporting your plans, you ought to. Uh, be straightforward in terms of, of what the reduction in harvest and job loss may be from those plans. We, we've tried to, get and to attribute those to the yeah. OWL uh, proposal really is, I think, uh, maybe confusing the situation. Yeah. See, the, the problem we, we have is that uh, we've been operating in the last two or three years higher than, than any of the, the plan levels and there, therefore had the uh, the difficulty that we knew we were going to reduce harvest levels to some extent anyway. Uh, and I don't think that anything needs to get credited for that for an adjustment sure. down to, to the harvest levels. And the other is that there is a substantial measure of protection for the spotted owl in, implicit in both the draft forest okay. plans well, that we really, had on the street that, and the final plans. Really, okay, I, I so appreciate it's an overlap, that. To preserve but, my yeah. time. And, mm -hmm. um, let, let me ask this question. Uh, the, uh, uh, the new perspectives in forestry has been, uh, has been discussed today. Uh, uh, would, would, I have made this request before. Would you provide to this committee some quantitative uh, analysis of the extent to which various components of new forestry are being implemented uh, during the current uh, year and any uh, goals that you may have for implementation uh, of various components uh, on a on a uh, region-wide or forest-wide or district uh, district basis, uh, we've heard a lot of talk, and I think it's good that we're hearing that discussion. But uh, I, I have not yet seen uh, quantitative uh, evidence of what is happening or a quantitative description of what is happening. Uh, and I guess my greater concern really is is what sort of time frame you're operating on. The last time you I asked you this question, you would not make any commitment in terms of any sort of time frame. And, and I would think now that several months have passed that if we're going to do this, we, we ought to have, there ought to be some sort of, uh, of goals. And, and you know, of course, that, that there then would have to be commensurate adjustments with regard to the ASQ. Uh, and, and that would have to be also projected at some point. I, I thank, thank the yeah, there's There's Time has elapsed for response, but if you can provide that for the record, we'll provide. We'll that, that would be try to be as responsive yeah. as possible to that. I'm I'm going to take a round since I would be next, and I, I'm going to make it try and make it brief because I do want to get on to the other witnesses, and I appreciate the patience of the other witnesses, and I will ask you both for further opportunities to discuss the issue. And, but 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 I just want to say just a couple of things, particularly reflecting on your testimony, uh, Mr. Leonard, and that is that, you know, it's, it's well known that I've expressed some frustration about the chief. And um, let me just, in light of your testimony, just go back to a couple of things, because you brought up a couple of sore points. You say, you know, you're perfectly confident that the Forest Service is following and complying with all the laws. Well, this is a question I asked the chief a year ago down the hall in the other hearing room uh, when the uh, DEIS had been challenged in court and uh, we were under injunction and, you know, timber harvesting was about to come to a halt and, and it had been a month or so or six weeks and there was no appeal of the injunction. And the chief came in totally confident that the DEIS was totally supportable, uh, perfect science, no problems. And I said to him, then chief, why have we not, why have you not appealed this injunction? Because had the environmental groups not obtained an injunction, they would have been in San Francisco the next morning at 9 o'clock to appeal 
the fact that they didn't receive an injunction, it wouldn't take them six weeks to decide whether or not to go to court uh, and appeal. And he said, well, there are legal problems. Now, on the one hand, there are, you know, there's no problems with the science or no problems with the management, but there's legal problems. But then we find out later that, in fact, there were no biologists working for the Forest Service who would testify in court in favor of the DEIS as at that point. So, I mean, so, so you've got to understand why there's a little bit of, uh, you, you know, why from this side of the podium, there's a little bit of concern about the information we're receiving. And, I, and what Mr. the point Mr. Jamison makes, I'd like to agree with him. I don't think that, you know, this is not something that anybody is going to be happy with when we come out the other side. I don't think the environmental groups are going to be totally satisfied. The industry isn't going to be totally satisfied. I'm not. My communities aren't. And so I think perhaps there's somewhat of a reluctance for people to offer, put a solution down on the table and then have it sort of tagged with them. And perhaps that's part of the administration's position here. I, can, can I bring up something that's been bothering me and I yep. want to get it off my chest? First of all, since I came on board, which has been a, um, almost a year now, right. the last administration was severely criticized for playing politics in the OWL situation sure. in Oregon. When I went down there, I said to myself, I'm going to have that process so squeaky clean that Peter DeFazio cannot say anything about it. And we have did that. Gary Studs I, was your problem last time. But, okay. Uh, Okay, I just want to make sure, right? <laughs> and then I made two other things. I said one is, is I'm not going to go down in monkey in the Jack Ward Thomas effort mm -hmm. because it will appear that we're going to play politics with the owl. I said we'll let the science speak. I made a point of not being informed of any of the activities of that thing. They had carte blanche to do it. Career employees were totally involved. There was not one political person in it. The first time that I was aware, not of the magnitude of it, of the Jack Ward Thomas was about four or five days before we briefed you. Mm -hmm. We've had this report approximately four weeks on our platter. What we've done in those four weeks is one is we spent a lot of effort to analyze so we could lay it out truthfully to the communities out in Oregon and especially to the, at least from my aspect, of what the real impacts of this were, no smoke and mirrors. We have done that. The next part of that process is I'm going to go back I think it behooves me as a land manager to take a look at Jack Ward Thomas and say, are there other options? And I am looking at other options. I do not have any available yet. We've just been at this a short time, and I'm going to try to have something else. I know when the hammer comes down, possibly June the 23rd. I'm going to do everything we can. We have the empathy of the people out there at Oregon. We're not playing games. We understand this is for, uh, you know, this is for the golden ring, and we're going to do everything we can. But I think we've been maligned up there. I was upset when you took after the president on this this morning. Well, and uh, I just I can, thought I'd I get, reclaim uh, my time. So I, I just want to get my side up. Right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. But, but if I can state for a moment, I, how many employees does the Forest Service have, Mr. Lennon? Approximately full time. Approximately 35,000. Okay, and how many does BLM uh, have in just, let's just say for Oregon? I think 1,600. Hmm? 1,600. Okay, so I have 21 on my staff, and we have to cover all the issues that a member of Congress has to cover. And I would say that my staff and I have come up with more innovative ideas, more ideas concretely starting more than a year ago in terms of commercial thinning and things like that to produce some alternate supplies of timber. This is the frustration on my side than all those 35 or 40,000 uh, you know, employees of the federal agencies and the president's administration combined. And that's my frustration on this side side, which is uh, I've got 21 people. My district is at the heart of this thing, and I'm trying to offer some productive and positive solutions. And what I hear from when I send letters to the president or suggestions to the president or, or make them to the agencies or talk to the chief is a resounding silence in response. And I, I, and I appreciate the fact of, you know, when the report came out and all that. But we knew before that that this was going to be somewhat devastating. I truthfully did not expect as much impact on the BLM lands as I see. I didn't either. And, and so I can understand your, you know, somewhat put, uh, I don't know, whatever by that. And I, 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 I don't want to take all the time, but, but what I'm saying is, you know, I, there's a tremendous frustration on this side too. And I, you know, and, and I, and I, you know, do not have the expertise, I mean, I gave a speech last week, I went into the lion's jaw, the, you know, you gave me the report, I got on the plane, I flew back to Oregon, and the next morning I spoke, gave the keynote address to the State Society of Foresters annual meeting, you know, all the assembled expertise in Oregon. And I said, here's what I see as a way out of this mess. And I offered seven points. I'd just like to see the administration come forward and give us a bunch of points. And, and if you need a little time, 
And it, but if you can tell us you're going to come back and do that, that's great. I can wait a little bit, you know. I mean, and I'll keep putting out my own We're ideas in the right meantime. Now. And I appreciate that. And maybe we can just sort of stop blaming one another at this point and go forward because it's it's crucial that we offer some solutions. But I, you know, but I really feel, and you've served on this side, and you know that Congress is not necessarily the best at proposing. We're better at disposing and tinkering and criticizing and quibbling and all those things. I mean, I'm trying to propose, but I think the administration can best propose given the magnitude of this problem. That's, that's my perspective. And, I, and one point I want to make is I don't want to bring a half-baked proposal up here. Right. And it doesn't make sense from the management, doesn't make sense from the people out in Oregon. They don't want to be brought up and taken down and brought up and taken down. No, we need we, certainty we need, some, we need some on certainty, both sides when we And it has to be this. practical and it has to be manageable and it has to con, uh, take in consideration our friends in the Fish and Wildlife Service and their role. So that's what we're trying to do. The secretary down there wears two hats on this. He wears the BLM hat over there of, of here's the impacts, and he also wears the other hat of protecting the Endangered Species Act. Right. And so that's the dilemma we're in, at least in Interior. All right. So Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, you've heard my side. Well, I feel so I've much heard, better now. I, well, I'm glad you do because we're going to have to work together. <laughs> so, and, I, and I took pains to not personally uh, align you in the testimony, but I just have felt until very recently that this wasn't heard at the highest levels it is. in the administration. And, uh, that's, that's the end of my tirade. Mr. Bosco. Um, Mr. Leonard, for many years uh, here in the Congress, we have been criticized for paying for roading and other infrastructure that's needed for uh, harvesting the federal forests, um, the theory being that we're not making off of those forests what we're paying into building the roads and whatever. And we've, we're all familiar with that argument. If you cut back on production by 48 percent in these forests, will, will that not exacerbate this claim that the infrastructure uh, costs don't uh, warrant the, uh, the production? Well, certainly if we, uh, if we cut back, uh, we'll, we'll have to relook at the land base that's available to us to manage. And, you know, in other words, the, the implications of, of establishing these habitat conservation areas is there's a big uh, area that we don't have to put roads into. Uh, and, when, and so over the long run, this will, will uh, reduce the uh, total investments we'll be making in, uh, in managing uh, those forests because we'll be managing fewer acres. But as uh, I understand this new age forestry or whatever mm -hmm. it's called, and I might say that I've been through several of these new forestry things over the last 20 years, so this isn't the first new forestry, and all of us know that. But under this new new forestry, um, as I understand it, each forest would have certain, would have all kinds of uneven age trees and, and would contain an ecosystem of variety. But how would you be able to justify putting roads through that type of a forest? But it does increase the cost per unit of land uh, that's measured, both in terms of uh, because you you get less yield uh, that's than what you I'm otherwise saying. would do. So have it does you, in, it does increase the cost. Yes. So have you factored into all? I mean, Ms. Unsold says it's a gloom and doom prediction. I can see a I can see in the future where it can be even worse where you come to Congress and say, in this particular forest, we have a 48 percent less than we can harvest. And already, right now, at 100 percent, Congress is telling you that the cost is too high. Uh, at some point, you get to that ratio where it isn't worth going into those forests to log anything. Isn't that true? I think that, that's true. Uh, we are fortunate, however, in, in dealing with, with the lands that are subject to this immediate question uh, of the spotted owl, we are dealing with very high value uh, t timberlands. And so there, you know, there is a margin for, for a adjustment in cost before you go deficit. It's not true as we will try to take that uh, concept into some other forest types. But uh, these are extremely high value timberlands that we're talking about uh, imposing constraints on. So by virtue of the limited nature of the land, you feel that the, the increased value will support the infrastructure, is that? I, th I think what we're, yes, I, I think generally in this particular area it would. Mm -hmm. And to some extent we're faced, uh, we're trying to find a way to keep yields coming off those lands rather than simply uh, setting them aside. 
it's interesting that right now there's such criticism of this infrastructure cost. You're talking about losing $148 million a year to the Federal Treasury and then coming back here and expecting that the Appropriations Committee is still going to appropriate money for roads? Well, well that will be the next uh, scene, I'm sure, in this, uh, this ongoing uh, drama. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll, I'll thank the panel for their patience and the time uh, they gave us today and look forward to their solutions in the near future. Proposals. Proposals. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm actually, I just say that uh, we do have a, a next panel, and uh, Ms. Unsold, would you like to uh, um, introduce the next panel? C-SPAN's coverage of this congressional well, hearing on timber harvesting will continue in just a moment following a break for schedule information. Fine. You're watching C-SPAN, and right now we pause for a look at the schedule. But first a reminder, tune to America and the Courts this week for a look at...